I'm thrilled to be here to welcome uh, all friends and new friends in this uh, technical session of the Wallenberg Prize 2022. It is a great honor to welcome you all. Yesterday we had a wonderful banquet. Uh, today we have a second banquet, a banquet of ideas. And I think uh, uh, really we have an amazing lineup of speakers. Uh, we're going to have uh, two parts. In the first part, a technical session uh, related more to the technical developments. And in the second part, we're going to tackle other aspects related to wearing wood. That's the subject of uh, today's uh, uh, session. Um, just uh, to let you know that uh, there are online participants. There are a little bit more than 100 delegates attending online, so the session will be recorded. I also ask you to turn off your cell phones and be open-minded. I think this will be an amazing session. At the end, we're going to have 30 minutes of questions and answers. Without further ado, I would like to welcome uh, Mr. Um, Marcus uh, Wallenberg, Chair of the Wallenberg Foundations, to do the opening. Thank you. Thank you, Orlando. Um, good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah, that's perfect. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Great to see you here this morning. Um, this prize, as we discussed yesterday, is really all about trying to further the interest around forest and forest production and forest industry and the possibilities about the future. Uh, I think that that is one of the key messages that we have, uh, over time, been able to um, deliver. And I think it's only a start of what the possibilities are for the future. Uh, Johanna Buchert and the whole uh, team in the selection committee, I think, has been putting together what I think can be a very interesting and fruitful program for today, wearing wood and the world of wood-based textiles. I think that this will address both big and small companies. And academia and industry has an incredibly important role to work together to find new ways to use this recyclable and really sustainable material that we can do things with for the future. And I really hope that we will be able to continue to develop technically and industrially what we are all uh, working with on a continuous basis. We have a very tricky situation in my mind. We have a, a political force driving the question around forests in one direction. Um, and I think it goes a little bit to the contrary. Uh, and this is a worrying fact. Uh, there are two sides to this coin, as we know. On one side, the whole sustainability part. On the other side, the potential of using the wood fiber as a potential material to solve a lot of the sustainable questions for the future. And these two forces have to meet at some point. And I think this is something uh, for us working with this on a daily basis. We have to keep an eye on this and make our voices heard in this debate because otherwise it might fall in a different direction that we are really wanting to see. As part of the uh, mission for the prize, we have set out the wish to have young researchers joining this. And when I look at other businesses that we are involved with, it's obvious that many of those businesses, different industries, are benefiting from the involvement of researchers, young researchers, who bring in new ideas and bring in the entrepreneurial aspect of what those industries and how those industries can develop. It seems to me that in the world of textiles, that could be as just one example, but I think in all many other aspects, the, 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 the possibility to see young researchers turning into their ideas 
into entrepreneurial effort in one way or another will also for this industry or the forest industry be a very, very important part. So I really want to wel welcome all of you to be here. At last, I really want to thank the selection committee for bringing such a wonderful group of good speakers together. Really interesting. And thank you for traveling from very far apart to join us here today. And thereby, I'd like to turn over the word to Orlando again. And thank you very much for being here. Hey, Moshe, Marcus, it was a wonderful opening, a lot of wisdom. And uh, now I have the distinctive pleasure to introduce uh, one of the laureates, uh, Professor Herbert Sixta. We're going to call him Herbert during the sessions. We're going to use the, the first names to make this a more familiar uh, exchange. And uh, you already know about uh, uh, Herbert. Uh, he is uh, Professor Emeritus in Alto University, and he will be talking for 30 minutes about the favorite subject uh, of his. So please, Herbert. Yeah, thank you so much, dear Orlando, for this kind introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm overwhelmed to be here. Thank you for this enormous and nice uh, event, uh, especially grateful to Markus Wallenberg, of course. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it's my real pleasure to introduce Ion Cell and its possible place in the textile industry given the particular challenges of climate change. As an introduction, I would like to start with a short historical overview on textile fibers and spinning technologies. As you certainly know, in the early history of mankind, textile fibers were exclusively made of natural fibers. That's quite obvious, but it was evidenced by a 30,000-year-old flex fiber found in the Republic of Georgia. That's the first uh, experimental evidence of uh, textile fibers. And it's also well known that the Sumerians were able to spin and weave flex fibers many years back. And since the Neolithicum, natural fibers as we still use them today, like cotton, silk and wool, have been used as textile material. However, the development of the industrial production of textiles is a relatively new invention, and it was fueled by a strong population growth in the early 19th century. It began, all began actually, at the 1889 Paris World Exhibition where Count Hilaire de Chardonnay for the first time presented a cloth entirely made of synthetic fibers. It was cellulose nitrate. And he called it artificial silk. However, due to high flammability and also high costs, it was soon replaced by viscose fibers. And viscose technology has been developed by Three gentlemen, Cross, Beaven and Beadle in UK. And you are aware that this technology is still the most dominant technology for the production of man-made cellulose fibers. The development of synthetic fibers goes back to the 1930s, where the very famous chemi chemist uh, Wallace Carothers invented nylon 6-6, and 10 years later, John Rex Winfield invented polyester. So that was the start of a really, uh, let's say, growing uh, industry. Although the first uh, direct cellulose solvent, n methyl morpholine anoxide, has already been patented in 1939 by Charles Granacher, it took another 30 years until this idea was took up by Kodak, and they used this invention 
to develop a lyocell process. But another 23 years later, the first commercial lyocell plant came on stream in Mobile, Alabama, in US, by Curto first, and soon later by Lansing in Heiligreitz, Austria. And it's still the most, let's say, uh, awarding technique for the production of man-made cellulose fibers. Three different spinning technologies produce, uh, regenerated, uh, are produced by regenerated cellulose fibers. Dry spinning, as you see here, uh, there a low boiling solvent evaporates in the spinning chamber by the introduction of hot air in a counter current flow, thereby gradually solidifying the filament. This technique was used for the production of cellulose nitrate and is still used for the spinning of cellulose diacetate. Of course, the most dominant spinning technique is the wet spinning technique, and it is in commercial use uh, for the cuprammonium process and the viscous process, but also for new developments, uh, for example, cellulose carbamate and uh, a variety of different spinning technologies using diluted sodium hydroxide as a cellulose solvent, like tree to textile, biocellosol, but also spinover, they use a pop suspension for wet spinning. And last but not least, dry jet wet spinning. It was adopted by the lyocell process, and the lyocell process uh, is connected to the use of a so-called direct cellulose solvent. And there, the spinning dope passes uh, the air gap, you see that here, and thereby um, a, a strong stretching is possible, which leads to a high orientation of the cellulose molecules parallel to their molecular axis, which is a prerequisite for strong and powerful fibers. Now I would like to give you a short overview about the global fiber market, and it's amazing to look back to the last 120 years of fiber development. Until the 1990s, the per capita fiber consumption was clearly dominated by natural fibers. And only then, uh, the synthetic fibers basically started to be the dominant fiber species. Today, we have almost a share of 70% on the global fiber consumption. Man-made cellulose fibers, in particular viscose fibers, they peaked around 1970s and uh, dropped to a minimum in the year around 2000 due to many, many closures of plants, especially in Central Europe, Europe, Russia, Americas. And during the time, uh, some of the companies also made their homework and cleaned up the sites, which was a prerequisite for the steep upswing, what you see here uh, after 2000, where a lot of new installations were built, especially in Asia and China. The biggest growth by 2030 is predicted for cellulosics. Why? The first reason is uh, cotton fiber stagnates in the growing and in the consumption. And on the other side, uh, the demand of cellulosics uh, further increases. So that's a good opportunity also to develop new man-made cellulose fiber processes. When evaluating a new fiber or even fiber category, then it's very important to assess its quality um, in reference to the main reference fibers. Sometimes that is forgotten, so we just develop new fibers and we don't care what are the uh, reference fibers, how they look like. So that's very important to have an uh, overall look at that. For the sake of simplicity, I selected uh, the strength properties as the major criterion for the uh, uh, fiber properties. And here you see um, the uh, dry and wet tensile strength of the natural fibers. Hemp and flax uh, show very strong uh, tenacities, particularly under wet conditions. 
even higher than under dry conditions, while the major synthetic fibers also show excellent uh, strength properties and especially uh, tough, high toughness values due to uh, high extensibility of the fibers, which is very unique for synthetic uh, fibers and is very tough to achieve with uh, cellulosic fibers. While at the same time, regular man-made cellulose fibers show quite low properties, mechanical properties, and especially under wet conditions, with two exceptions. The first one is what I mentioned already, the lyocell fibers. And uh, due to their high orientation, they have a nice uh, and high wet tenacity. And a speciality viscous fiber, uh, we call it the Supercore 3. It's used uh, for the in re uh, reinforcement of tire cords. So these two uh, are exceptional with regard to the properties. Yeah, now what is the fate of the textiles at the end of their service life? That's uh, the $1,000 question. And currently, the textile industry predominantly follows a so-called linear business model. What does it mean? A linear business model means that the textiles basically immediately end up in landfill and incineration after only an average uh, wearing cycle of 20 washes. That's an average, of course. And currently, the amount of uh, textiles which are given a second life is very low. It's uh, about 3.5% and most of it uh, is uh, concerned the resale or the rental. You see that uh, uh, the uh, linear business model uh, is getting an outdated uh, model and we need to look for alternatives. Why? Because first of all we have a loss of, a lot of, a loss of value due to this uh, short uh, uh, life cycle. And the second is of course an enormous pollution. So therefore we have to work for alternative uh, concepts. So more in detail, where do the fibers uh, finally end up after use? Uh, of the 84% of the fibers are either incinerated or um, the landfilled, of which one third uh, consists uh, of uh, natural polymers, cellulose or protein fibers, and two thirds of synthetic fibers. And the problem associated with synthetic fibers is not that they are not recyclable. That's relatively clear and it's possible and even uh, easily possible. But the problem is the almost non-existing biodegradability. And that concerns many of the synthetic uh, polymers. And here you see uh, the most important representative of synthetic fibers, polyester. So basically, with the standard tests, no uh, biodegradability. And that is about to be confirmed in long-term investigations currently done by the Scripps Institute in close to San Diego. Uh, there are deep sea uh, investigations of differ different material swatches, and you see here just the comparison between polyester and lyocell. But even that is not the only problem, but it is clearly associated with the uh, most important problem associated with synthetic, fi synthetic fibers, namely the release of microplastic fiber. Yesterday, I had the privilege to sit next to the queen, and she told me that her 10-year-old uh, granddaughter refuses to eat fish because she said fish contains plastic. Yeah? So that is really an issue and we have to work on, uh, on this uh, uh, also from, from the fundamental point of view to avoid the release of microplastic fibers upon uh, laundry. Now I would like to briefly introduce the ion cell fiber process and show step by step what role this process could eventually play in the transition to a sustainable uh, textile industry. The most important feature or one of the most important features is the use of a powerful uh, solvent, direct solvent for cellulose. And we selected a so-called protic ionic liquid 
with high thermal stability, with a high dissolution power, and with uh, an environmental footprint very comparable to N-methylmorphaline anoxide. Currently, we are working with three of these protic ionic liquids, and both uh, so-called amidinium and guanidinium-based cations. And uh, the development of these uh, solvents is fully credited to my colleague, Professor Ilka Kilpleinen, and his team. Another aspect of the lyocell technology compared to the wet spinning uh, processes is the fewer unit operations. So it's a much simpler process and it's a closed system with only one chemical uh, input. That's the solvent and that we have to keep in the cycle. And this is also a difference to the current NMMO based lyocell because they have to add uh, stabilizers and also other chemicals uh, for the regeneration of ion exchange resins, for example. So we think that the concept here is uh, quite future-oriented. The decisive unit operations of the ion cell process comprise both. First, the production of a homogeneous uh, cellulose solution to ensure stable spinning and, of course, the air gap spinning concept. Um, the manufacture of uh, this uh, highly viscous spinning dope requires high shear forces, really high shear forces, and that is uh, achieved in a kneader or in an extruder, for example. These are two examples, it's not complete. And uh, under the microscope, you see a very fast and complete dissolution. Here you see pulp fibers which basically disappear upon time and when it's black it's fully dissolved. So what are actually the key innovations of ion cell? The first one is what I mentioned already, the selection of the most appropriate direct cellulose solvent. I talked about that already. And the second one is the adjustment of the flow behavior of a viscoelastic fluid, that's the spinning dope, inside the capillaries of the spinneret and also in the air gap. So what kind of flow behavior do we have? Um, in the capillaries, we have a dominant shear flow and that means that the viscosity decreases upon the deformation rate. Why? Because of the gradual disentanglement of the polymer chains and, of course, also their pre-orientation. And that depends on the geometry of the spinneret and, of course, also the conditions during the extrusion. While in the air gap, we have a dominant extensional or elongational flow uh, with uh, the unique uh, observation that this extensional flow increases upon the increase of deformation rate. Why? Because of the parallel orientation of the molecular chains. So these two different flow patterns we have to tackle and that's the innovation uh, of this process. And here you see two examples of a stable spinning in the air gap. I hope you see it. And what you should observe is that the filaments uh, uh, exiting from the spinnerets align in parallel as soon as you apply a stretch. And here you see the goddess where the stretch is applied. And the stretch ratio is much higher than in all the other spinning technologies, which ensures the high molecular orientation, a prerequisite for high strength properties. Besides the high tenacity, Ion cell fibers have this natural luster, which not always is a desired property, but in most of the times. Now, what is the sustainability? We claim sustainability. What is the sustainability of the ion cell process? It, uh, is, the sustainability is ensured by a complete closure of the solvent and the water cycles. Here you see a scheme, I promised it's the only one. Uh, it's a closed cycle of the, uh, of the solvent. And in numerous trials, my dear students and colleagues have 
tested the recyclability of the, of the solvent. Uh, using here, for example, this thin film evaporator. And uh, at the moment, uh, uh, we state that uh, the recovery rate of the ionic liquid is around 99% or above. This is, of course, with the restriction that this is a batch mode, where we simulate a continuous flow, uh, in this case, for 20 cycles. Now I come to the next topic, which concerns the raw materials. This is very important, and uh, we will hear uh, a talk from uh, Frank Meister after my talk, uh, how important the properties of the raw materials, for example, wood pulp, uh, is on the process, processability, and on uh, the fi uh, final products. I was so lucky in Alto University that I had a team, even though we had a small device for spinning, we could produce, look at that, uh, a numerous amount of nice dresses. And that was only possible by the help of my students, my researchers, and also by the help of the researchers from our School of Arts, the Department of Textile Design, who take care, took care of our yarns, what we produced, and then manufactured uh, fabrics through weaving, through knitting, then finishing, dyeing, everything, designing, and even the fashion show. They covered everything. So from wood to fashion show, that's the cradle. Of course, we need to look ahead, um, and the future is a good balance between the use of sustainable uh, wood pulp from sustainable forests and recycled uh, textile wastes. And so <clears throat> I show you a selection of different um, uh, cellulosic wastes we were able to upcycle. The first example, uh, concerns cardboard waste. Uh, that was in the very beginning when we started, and you see it was possible that we could convert the cardboard waste to staple fibers, to yarns, to fabrics, and they look a little bit different, so they have different color. The reason for that is the different lignin content, which also shows that our process can also take in other biopolymers like lignin, hemicellulose, ketin, chitin, chitosan, and so forth. And the difference in the colors, our designers liked it because they could play with the colors, so the different yellowish, brownish colors, and that was because of the different lignin content. Another important example is the recycling of more or less uniform textile wastes. In this particular case, it was the uh, old gene. And in this case, we not only recycled the cellulose, but also the vet dye. And uh, we could uh, basically preserve the, the color, and you see this nice baby shirt, and that is from the old gene. Another example, or two other examples of post-consumer cotton waste in the upper one, a more difficult uh, task, uh, uh, which was uh, solved by Simone, my PhD student at that time, and her task was to concomitantly recycle the reactive dyes. And reactive dyes is a different issue because they are covalently bonded to the cellulose, so it was not so easy. But still you see that it was possible and uh, we had a small fading of the color. What you also see on the right side, you see, I don't want to give you the details here, but there is a yellowish area and the greenish area. The yellowish area symbols the uh, strength properties of the virgin fibers uh, on the market, and the yellowish, uh, the strength properties uh, of the upcycled cycle. And do you see? Okay, without seeing the numbers, it's up and to the right. So it's better than the virgin colors, uh, virgin fibers. And the same applies to the wasted cotton roll towels, also there we had very successful recycling results. The same also with hemp waste, uh, we played this through. A very important invention was also the selective uh, separation of cotton polyester. Why is that so important? Because these are the most abundant blends on the market, so we need to look for solutions uh, to 
uh, recycle both parts of this plant, both in this case polyester and cellulose, and through our process a selective dissolution of the cellulose is possible, which directly leads to the spinning of ion cell, and the residue is pure enough to be also further utilized either by chain extension or repolymerization. This is a very unique uh, example. And the Bank of Finland and the European Central Bank contacted us and said, OK, every year 6,000 tons and more of old banknotes are incinerated. This is high value cellulose. Come on, what to do with that? So we can't always uh, incinerate them. And so they supported us and our student here. And indeed, it was possible to recycle the banknotes and produce yarns and fabrics. And the last example I show you is also quite nice because uh, this is what I didn't know, the production of luxury textiles. They use a lot of uh, cashmere wool or silk and by producing the products, uh, there is a lot of loss of these valuable fabrics. So they can't use them, maybe in insulation or something like that. So it's a waste of material and, co and, and uh, cost. So uh, we decided uh, to use this in a blend with the cellulose and produce the nice hybrid cellulose protein fibers. And to our surprise, we found that by blending the proteins with the cellulose, the su surface hydrophilicity was completely changed. And also what is a, an issue in lyocell, I don't know if, if you know that, namely the tendency of fibrillation, and that was massively reduced. So that was a great achievement. We never thought about that. Now I come to my end. Which role, I come back to my first question, can ion cell play in the business model predicted for 2030 and beyond? And of course, that must be a circular business model. And uh, according to a recent uh, Ellen MacArthur study, um, it's predicted that 23% of the global value of uh, the textiles will basically given a second life, which does not look very much, and mostly achieved through resale and rental, not uh, due to recycling in that sense. But still, even this share of 23% represents a value of 700 billion US dollars, and what is even more important, uh, a decrease in uh, greenhouse gas emissions of 340 million tons. Now, before I would like to come to the final end and make my final assessment um, about ion cell, I want to pick up this idea from L. MacArthur. They made, pinpointed down to three ambitions. Ambition one is uh, to ensure biodegradability through renewable resources. I think that is fulfilled. Do you agree? Okay, we can say yes. So there are two more ambitions, and they are governing, governing the longevity of the textiles. And the first criterion is the mechanical strength. So our, our hypothesis is with increasing high, uh, mechanical strength, the longevity of the textiles is also positively influenced. And the second is, of course, also to increase the utilization rate by chemical recyclability. And we will then step by step address these questions. First, uh, the higher longevity through higher mechanical strength properties. Um, to this end, we need to return to our graph showing uh, the list of uh, representative fibers on the market with related to their strength properties. So you remember this graph. And in our development, the ion cell uh, fibers we centered in the development of a so-called regular fiber, which uh, is a low-cost fiber, so with wood pulp of uh, uh, relatively uh, yeah, low purity, um, and that is our standard grade. And then, of course, also we started to investigate the so-called high tenacity grade, especially high tenacity in the sense of high toughness. That's important for textiles. And these two grades, you see, fit quite well 
into the upper range of this uh, mechanical of the uh, uh, of the mechanical properties of these fibers. So I would say, and together with a more detailed uh, showing, the stress strain behavior of ion cell clearly exceeds uh, the stress strain behavior of uh, commercial cellulosic fibers on the market. So we could conclude, in short, yes, ambition two, more or less fulfilled. And then the third ambition, we have to look if the chemical recyclability is also uh, ensured. And we took that very seriously. And we started two years ago with a big program with two students from different fields uh, to test the recyclability of our own fiber following this clear scheme from pulp, ion cell, staple fibers, yarns, fabrics, and 50 washi. Can you imagine how much work that is in the laboratory? Unbelievable. Uh, so we had to really produce a lot of fibers and produce fabrics, uh, 50 washes and so forth. And we managed uh, to uh, achieve two complete uh, cycle steps. That's enormous. And of course, as expected, the so-called degree of polymerization is affected over the stages. But, and that is where I have to use my pointer, very amazing. You see here during the washing, 50 washes, basically no change in the degree of polymerization occurred, which is a clear indication that uh, these fibers have a high durability. So that was amazing. We did not expect that. Uh, together with more detailed uh, GPC measurements, we, yeah, and you see also here that the tenacity was still on a good level, even though we used uh, the degraded cellulose as an input for the production of uh, ion cell fibers. But together with additional measurements, uh, we calculated the so called chain scission. When you have one molecule, then you can easily calculate how many. Uh, scissions you have per molecule. And with this information, you can calculate uh, the number of chemical cycles with different assum uh, assumptions. We, the first assumption was an initial viscosity of 600. Then we end up in two full chemical cycles. When we increase it a little bit, then we have four cycles. Of course, this is a theoretical consideration. In practice, we would run the ion cell process at constant dp. That means that we have to uh, compensate for the decrease in uh, polymerisa degree of polymerization by the blending with other uh, substrates. But this is what we found out and experimentally verified two chemical cycles. So that means that we can make our final conclusion Yes, ambition to longevity through highest tensile strength. Yes, we can say that has been achieved. And of course, we have to further improve that. And also the chemical recyclability, the first indication is yes, it was approved. And we can say it is really achieved. So we can say that ion cell has the potential, at least, to allow uh, a real uh, prolongation of the life cycle of uh, the textile fibers. Now, what is uh, the future of ion cell? Um, a short outlook on, on that. And we were quite busy, thanks to our generous support from Alto University, to basically build up uh, a pilot plant during the pandemic. So our engineers, our students utilized the time and built up a nice pilot plant. And a few months ago, we founded a startup company named Ion Cell OE. Yeah, quite logical name. And now the real reality starts because from beginning of next year uh, until end of 2024, we have to show that this process is capable of running in a continuous mode, that the recyclability of the solvent is as we have predicted in the batch mode. That is, of course, clear. And if everything goes out as we uh, think and hope, then uh, in 2025, uh, we will start with the next steps. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your patience. Thank you for uh, basically uh, 
attending this nice conference. But my special thanks uh, go to the Markus Wallenberg uh, Committee for awarding this prize. Uh, of course, to Aalto University and the Finnish uh, government uh, for their great financial support, for the Erko Foundation, which enabled the building and financing of the pilot plant. Very happy about that. And of course, uh, to my colleague Ilka Kilpleinen and his team for the successful and excellent collaboration. And this is the most uh, important treasure you have at the university, good students, and we had a lot of them, and researchers and colleagues who uh, contributed to this work. And last but not least, I have to say, Lansing AG, without having worked there for 25 years plus 5 years, 30 years, it would not have been possible to enter into this project. So I'm very, very happy about that. And uh, uh, Lansing AG also publishes a scientific journal, Lensinger Berichte. And to my mind, it's the highest level publication on these issues. And please have a look, it is, uh, it's online, you can access it. And the latest uh, edition also gives you some insight about my life at Lansing and of course also later. And finally, also thanks a lot to my family who endured my Finnish diaspora for 15 years. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Herbert. What a great summary. We really enjoy it. Uh, wonderful prospects. I think a lot of things uh, for us to think about and uh, the future developments that we could expect from this development, the ion cell development. Uh, I was uh, thinking that it is funny that in the 1800s, uh, paper was made from old rags and discarded uh, clothing. Right Now we're reverting this. Now we use uh, discarded uh, paper to make uh, <laughs> textiles. So it's a little bit paradoxical. Very, very, very interesting. Now I'm very pleased to introduce the next speaker, continuing with the technical aspects of uh, today's uh, event. I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Frank Meister. Frank is the head of chemical research uh, department at the Turingian Institute of Textiles and Plastics. This is a private research organization. This is very important to highlight. This uh, collaboration between industry, universities, and research institutes like uh, TITK. So uh, welcome, Frank. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. After this firework of uh, new ideas and uh, inspiration, it's not so easy for me to show uh, some technical aspects inside this direct dissolution process. Nevertheless, I will try uh, to uh, give more insights in the raw materials and the impacts on dissolution uh, for cellulose man-made fiber spinning. First of all, congratulate again uh, the <laughs> Professor Herbert Sixta and Professor Ilka Kippelinen on behalf of the whole TITK team for this awarding a Mar Markus Wallenberg Prize. Uh, it is a real good decision of this committee for this year. Let's begin again with this outstanding merits of the ion cell technology. Uh, you see again, uh, I have taken another uh, presentation of this process uh, to have, sorry, uh, to have this uh, cycle uh, idea inside. Uh, and inside this cycle, I will uh, speak more about this uh, interaction between pulp production and fiber spinning. Nevertheless, ion fiber are belonging, or fibers are belonging uh, to wood fibers, and the most important thing, not only is this very uh, prosperous uh, perspective, although uh, this kind of wood fibers keeps the CO2 in the loop. That's very important uh, for today. Uh, 
Suitable pulps, we have heard it, uh, are mostly made of wood and uh, all kind of uh, modern uh, wood pulping, a sulfide process and pry hydrolysis craft process could be applied. We have also seen that other kind of material could be used, especially recycled cellulose materials coming from cotton or sand -made, uh, cellulose man-made fibers, and uh, that's uh, a very huge dis uh, uh, advantage of this kind of uh, direct dissolution spinning. Let's start with uh, characterization of these pulps in more detail. Uh, from lignocellulose and also from textile waste, these uh, materials have to separate from site components and impurities before it could be used as a pulp. You see it here in uh, these uh, uh, picture that uh, at the beginning, coming from wood, there is a mixture of different uh, components, mostly lignin, cellulose and hemicellulose, and you will end up in the pulping process with uh, the cellulose, uh, which is consisting of uh, macromolecules. Cellulose itself, it's a semi-crystalline polymer and it's consisting of chains of different chain lengths. And uh, for an optimal dissolution, physiochemical and structural properties have to be adjusted to comparable values. What are these comparable values? Uh, or even what are the pulp properties affecting the dissolution? On the one hand side, these are molecular properties like degree of polymerization, molecular weight distribution, or even the properties of the dopes made of this pulp. This affected, more or less, the dope quality, viscoelastic flow, chain, detangle speed, deformation, relaxation rates. We have already heard that these are very important uh, values, especially also for spinning uh, in the air gap. But also the chemical composition and the purity could uh, affect it, uh, these uh, dissolution behavior, especially if you think to a technical, to a more technical process, that means to repeat the dissolution and the spinning properties. And of course, we have heard there's a danger for solvent decomposition and it is mostly caused by the purity of the pulp. But also uh, economical values like recovery rate and uh, these uh, uh, very high economic efficiency of this kind of processes. Crystallinity or crystalline structure and fiber homology uh, are most important, especially for solvent migration rate and a perfect dissolution state. Have this in mind, uh, we uh, investigate the dissolution of pulp in this direct dissolution process. Uh, I have to stem at this side. We do it not in the same manner as Herbert has uh, shown. That means to use ionic liquid for the dissolution. We use the common solvent, uh, NMMO, and at any time we have calculated these parameters on the basis of a dope with about 12% of cellulose inside. But uh, we have also uh, focused on different kind of raw material, especially uh, these uh, agricultural residues, straws from hemp and also from linseed flax. The most important uh, area of uh, so-called soft or hot woods or even paper pulp and of course also uh, recycled cotton were in our focus when we investigate this process. That means we also focused on typical kind of commercial available pulps uh, for our selection. And uh, I will not go too much into these details, but uh, I will give 
some uh, more uh, parameters which are uh, most important for that. We have focused on a degree of polymerization in this range, uh, also Herbert has mentioned. And uh, we also uh, have this polydispersity, which is a very important uh, property of pulp, especially if you have these uh, for direct dissolution. You see, uh, we have uh, selected uh, polydispersities in the range of three to six, and uh, the polydispersity is a quotient of molecular weight, uh, f um, the weight average and the number average of the molecular weight. It is also our aim to have a high cellulose content, uh, higher than 90%. You see, we have not in all cases, and I will show that uh, there are also some opportunities if you not have such high uh, purity of the uh, pulp. Uh, we have uh, low HAMI content in the range of 4 to 10%. Uh, percent that is more important from the technical point of view because if you have very high hemicellulose content, uh, there's a danger that they are not uh, precipitated again after a cycle and so in technical processes you will increase this concentration over a number of different uh, dissolution and spinning cycles. And, uh, of course, uh, low metal salt contents are required. Uh, that means especially heavy metal have this, uh, this uh, property that they can decompose the uh, solvent. That's why they should limit it below 10 ppm. And the same is valid uh, for alkali and earth alkali metal uh, concentration. But here uh, it is more a focus of the uh, more easy uh, solvent recovery. What are uh, the good opportunity to compare pulp dissolution behavior by its molecular properties? And uh, you're well familiar with this. Uh, cellulose as a native polymer is characterized by different uh, degree of polymerization. That means uh, different kind of cellulose or even of pulp uh, are different in their individual mass. Uh, uh, and that is very different from uh, the low molecular uh, substances. That's why uh, the uh, most important uh, parameter after degree of polymerization is molecular weight distribution. You see in the picture two different uh, kind of uh, molecular weight distribution of two different uh, substrates of cellulose. And uh, the molecular weight distribution de describes this uh, frequency of all polymer chains representing uh, a specialist chain length or even molar mass. Number average uh, molecular weight uh, or even uh, viscose average uh, molecular weight and uh, these uh, weight average weight and finally uh, so-called centrifuge average of uh, the molecular weight could be measured by uh, the same statistic and that's why uh, these uh, values are comparable and you conclude from uh, the numbers of these uh, averages uh, uh, special uh, effect of different kind of pulps inside the dissolution. Uh, in this uh, curve, we have on the left-hand side uh, low uh, polymer or short polymer chains and on the right-hand side the long polymer chains. And you will see, especially if we change uh, to the dissolution, uh, these values are very important. From uh, these molecular weights, you can cl conclude, uh, we have uh, here also uh, used this paper pulps, and uh, it is not uh, surprisingly, but untreated paper pulps present the produce molecular weight distribution. Uh, you see it in the blue curve. And uh, we found a way uh, to uh, 
degrade these, uh, pre, uh, these uh, paper pulps by an enzyme pretreatment to coming uh, nearer to the requirements I have mentioned before. For these uh, wood pulp, uh, you see uh, a moderate uh, or an optimal uh, molecular properties uh, and that is valid also for the hemp shive pulps we investigated. The differences between these two uh, pul uh, pulps could be uh, uh, detected on the low uh, uh, end, uh, of course, also on the uh, high molecular slope. Finally, uh, recycling cotton and uh, linseed, uh, this is, uh, another group uh, of this pulp we investigated, show the narrowest uh, distributed cellulose, uh, and again, I will show what it means for the dissolution behavior. That brings me uh, to a somewhat difficult uh, issue inside the characterization of the impacts of uh, pulp on dissolution, and that is uh, this uh, question of deformation or relaxation behavior uh, of cellulose dopes. Uh, for spinning solution, as well as uh, for ion cell uh, dopes, it is most important that they have a viscoelastic flow. That means uh, this is mandatory uh, for a process uh, uh, which is called dry jet wet spinning or air gap spinning. The viscoelastic flow of dope presents uh, these uh, characteristics of the pulps that they present different degrees of movement of the polymer chains when applied uh, strain. And uh, you see the uh, experiment which is behind uh, that you have a, uh, to set a deformation step and you look how uh, reacts this dope uh, in this relaxation behavior. That means uh, in deformation, uh, the uh, dope applied strain and in relaxation, it induce, uh, the induced stress uh, could be uh, de detected. Relaxation means it describes the recovery of the polymer males or solution when deformation kept constant. And you see from the picture uh, that there is uh, in a polymer not only one relaxation behavior because we have different lengths of these molecules, we have also different uh, relaxation behavior. And that brings us to a very interesting uh, opportunity to characterize uh, these uh, behavior or these impacts uh, of uh, pulps in dissolution, uh, that is uh, the so-called uh, relaxation time spectra. We measured that very easily uh, and we could uh, characterize three different groups of uh, pulps. Uh, the first one, it was uh, the paper pulp, which presents the broadest uh, molecular weight distribution, uh, distribution and the highest viscoelasticity. You can see, uh, even if we have this uh, enzymatic treatment, we have a very low deformation rate and uh, an open relaxation time spectra. That means that especially the highest uh, or the longest uh, polymer chains uh, do not give any contribution to the viscoelastic flow in this area we have investigated. For these uh, wood and hemp dissolving pulps, we could indicate an optimal viscoelastic uh, flow. That means a well-balanced deformation rate too. And finally, the third group, 
where we have the dissolving pulps originate from recycled cotton and uh, all seed flags, which present highest quota of viscose flow. That means a high deformation and a fast relaxation. That uh, is very important to uh, take in our mind if you change to the uh, effect of deformation rate uh, at the fiber spinning process. You see on the sorry. You see on the uh, right uh, left hand side uh, a scheme of this air gap spinning uh, a little bit other than uh, Herbert has given. Uh, nevertheless, we have at uh, the upper uh, part uh, the spinneret where uh, the shearing stress dominates. We heard it uh, also from the lecture of Herbert. And afterwards, we have this air gap. And uh, in this air gap, deformation is more relevant. It becomes constant at the end of this uh, drawing process and the relaxation of the polymer dope set in. Low relaxation is typical for broad distributed pulps uh, allowing a spinning at a long air gap length. And uh, if you change uh, to a typical narrow distributed pulps, uh, it leads to limitation of the length of this uh, spinning uh, uh, of this air gap. And uh, so you have also uh, uh, the opportunity uh, to change it, or you have to change uh, in order to be able to spin such um, uh, materials such pulps uh, as coming from uh, textile waste. Nevertheless, uh, besides uh, the effect on the deformation and uh, relaxation, you have also some other uh, parameter which can affect it, this uh, deformation process inside the air gap. And uh, these are typically temperature, of course, and humidity or the uh, conditioning uh, inside the air gap, uh, but also uh, the dope concentration could affect it, these uh, properties uh, in the air gap. That brings me to the end of my presentation. Uh, I uh, acknowledge my uh, team, especially uh, Mrs. Uh, Dr. Kosan, uh, which uh, uh, she has also uh, she has uh, investigated all this uh, pulp and dope characterization. Uh, Frank Günther Niemes, he is uh, our head in uh, process technology, uh, and all the other uh, guys uh, for continuous spinning trials or process engineering. Uh, my Michael Sturm, that is our PhD, uh, it's a group of uh, Ilkay Kilpeleinen, and he is very uh, responsible for these new solvents uh, are used in ion cell. And uh, last but not least, all my uh, former colleagues uh, cells have uh, developed this basic uh, process uh, are acknowledged at this time. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Frank. It's very interesting to learn the complexities of uh, molecular weight effects and also the incorporations of uh, other types of fibers beyond wood-based fibers, right? Um, Non-wood uh, fibers, for example. So thank you for your insights. So the next uh, part before going to the break is uh, uh, to acknowledge a great session that uh, we had yesterday with the young uh, researchers. Um, we had about 30 presenters coming from many different areas in the world, and I think it was very exciting to see the innovation and the excitement uh, that uh, you know the science brings uh, all uh, us together, and you see a little bit of that in the posters that are outside. And what we're going to do next is to uh, award the best um, presentation, three minute presentations, giving talks for three minutes is very challenging, and I think uh, we are going to see the best poster, we're going to watch the video, and for that, my colleague from the uh, selection committee, Joris, uh, will uh, take uh, then now charge and do the announcement. Thank you, Joris. Very good. Thank you, Orlando. Um, 
So my name is Joris van Akkeren from the Ghent University and I was the moderator yesterday of the uh, Young Researcher Three Minutes presentations. Uh, actually really a challenge for the people and, and many or most of them have never done that before. They were well prepared I think and they did all a very good job. So when I'm announcing the winner, that does not mean that was the only very nice talk. We had 30 very nice talks. And you can actually, I'm not sure whether they are already online, but they will be online. This is the first time that we do that. And so every talk was recorded and you can follow them online and see them. Uh, it is my pleasure that I can announce the winner. Um, this afternoon, number two and number three will also be informed. But I can say that the winner was actually selected both by the expert team as the winner, as well as by the young researchers themselves selected the first person. So I should now use my hand and say then the winner is... Right. <laughs> you can read. You, you get a three minutes talk now and then you can come forward for accepting your win. I can with confidence say that in Finland we burn over two million tons of lignin each year, probably much more. But if you were the one that were responsible for this lignin, would you want to burn it? Or would you want to do something else? And if any one of us here in this room would want to be more sustainable and move into wood buildings. Would we want these buildings to be coated and glued with plastics? Of course you don't want plastics in your walls. And of course you don't want to burn millions of tons of lignin. If we are already now struggling to find renewable options for everyday products, we can't be burning one of the largest resources that we have available. I think that lignin in our societies will be a huge asset if we learn how to use it first. Um, my research focuses on making products with a super high lignin content, as much as I can. And I began by focusing on construction materials, because, for example, concrete is responsible for about almost 10% of the world's carbon dioxide emissions. And one really fruitful approach has been to first make epoxidized lignin, so it's basically grafting epoxy groups onto the lignin backbone and then reacting this with lignin particles. This material becomes very strong and it can be used, for example, for these beautiful coatings or these strong adhesives. And they have a lignin content of over 90%. And they are just as good as anything you would find in your hardware store. And they're also just as cheap. Because when I develop these products, I work together with process engineers and sustainability specialists to make sure that they would be just as cheap and more sustainable compared to anything that we have available in the market today. And you also, now the forestry industry needs to listen, you don't have to make any changes to the craft process. So you only have to build a couple of new facilities outside of existing pulp mills, basically turning them into modern lignin biorefineries. Now my vision for this is to broaden the applicability as much as I can. So now it's building materials. Next it could be composites, for example, for glass frames, phone, car doors. Maybe some of you <laughs> uses these products. And uh, for example, packaging. And if I succeed, our forests will give us a huge amount of an actually useful material that we can use to create a set of sustainable products that will help us make good decisions in our everyday life. Thank you. It's a preprint, but anyhow, very much congratulations. And you've seen that he really matched content and bringing the story, communication skills. And it's actually what three minute talks are about. You try to bring the message, but you also bring content and do that in a way. Uh, you used your hands, and I said that was an important one. Probably that was one of your extra pluses on your presentation, anyhow. So, very much congratulations. This is a 
preprint, I would say, from Wheel <laughs> Diploma. It's also covering a small price of um, some money. I think it's 5,000 Swedish krones. It's not comparable to what the laureates of the prize get here. But at, at least it's a stimulation that also in the next years we will have very nice presentations in this context. And I have this one as an extra gift that you can share with your colleagues if necessary. So, and we have some pictures, I think. Very good. Thank you very much. And uh, it's now time for all of you to go to coffee, I think. But I would definitely also invite you to go to all the posters. I mean, the posters are related to the presentations yesterday. Uh, I think there's also some printouts over there that you can take with the titles and all that. So you don't have to go all 30 of them, but at least select some of them that might be of interest. And the young researchers that have been invited to be at this symposium will be at their posters, and you can actually address them over there. So thank you very much for indulging with me for this very nice intro in between. Thank you. Welcome back. Uh, there is a lot of energy. Uh, we felt it outside and we will continue here inside. And this morning we cover innovation and research. In the second part of this session, we're going to listen about uh, clothing industry, fashion. Then we're going to move on to strategies, EU strategies and regulation. And then at the end, the perspective of the forest products industry. So we're going to have three talks, 20 minutes each. And as I said before, at the end, we will have the opportunity to have uh, questions and answers uh, session. So I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Martin Eckenbach. Um, Eckenbark. Uh, I learned that Eckenbark means uh, birch bark, which is a very nice uh, biomass that we can consider also for textiles. Uh, Martin comes from H&M. You all know H&M. He was also before in um, an, uh, IKEA. And now he's uh, heading since 2019 the Circular Innovation Lab in H&M. Welcome, Martin. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Hi everyone, nice to be here. Nice to see so many. Uh, my name is Martin Eckenbach. I'm heading the H&M Group Circular Innovation Lab. And uh, today I'm going to speak a little bit about what we do to support startups and innovators to scale up more sustainable materials in a faster way. Uh, and also relevant sustainable materials for us to use in the future. Uh, H&M Group is a family of brands. H&M uh, is, of course, the largest ones, but we also have Cost Weekday, Monkey, H&M Home, Stories, Arcade, Found, and then we have some business ventures as well. Uh, I've collected a few of the goals. We have quite, quite a lot of goals uh, in the H&M Group, but I've collected a few of them that I thought was most relevant for this topic. Uh, and the first one is that we, 2025, will use 30% recycled materials in our products. Uh, 2021, we reached 17.8%, uh, but we are still struggling with uh, increasing that. Uh, and I'm positive that we will reach 30% until 2025. All polyester used in our products will, by 2025, be 100% recycled. Uh, all wood used in our products and packaging will be made from FSC certified materials or fibers from alternative sources such as agricultural residues or post-consumer textiles. Uh, and that's also something we're working very hard to increase the textile to textile recycling. Uh, we will only source from producers of viscose and MMC fibers that have good environmental practices such as closed loop process processing of water and chemicals. And this is also very important for us. Uh, by the end of 2030, 
we will only use 100% recycled or other more sustainably sourced materials in our uh, supply chain. Uh, and to live up to this, uh, we started in 2019 the Circular Innovation Lab to try to speed up the development uh, in the industry and try to help all the innovators and uh, startups out there. Uh, because we saw that the materials that we need in order to reach these results aren't available uh, in large scales, uh, in large volumes and in the specific demands that we have. So we need to support the innovation community to, to scale up. Uh, and the first thing we did was that we tried to map out how do we work with, uh, with uh, innovators and startups uh, within the H&M group. So in these pictures, you can see Circle Innovation Lab, which is my team, working with uh, scouting, uh, testing, evaluating new and interesting processes and materials in our supply chain. And we're doing that in close collaboration with our brands, of course, because the brands are the ones that are demanding uh, new sustainable uh, materials. They're demanding a certain uh, quality, a certain hand feel, uh, a certain yeah, touch and feel of the materials, let's say. And through the brands, we're also working together with our supply chain. So that's the channel out to our supply chain, because we don't own our production. Uh, but we have very close cooperation with our supply chain. So that's the one we're using to evaluate these processes and materials in real life. And that's very valuable when you are a small company uh, with small volumes uh, at very high prices to be able to have our supply chain open up to evaluate the materials. Uh, we also have the H&M CoLab, which is a vital part in this innovation ecosystem. They're doing equity investments in startups. Uh, and what we're doing is that some of our projects might be part of the technical due diligence for them to then make an investment. But we're also able to work with the, uh, the companies within this portfolio to help them to develop their materials, to steer them in the right direction, to have the connection to our brands, and also to have the connection to our supply chain. Because equity uh, money is one thing, and our project uh, funding is a totally different thing uh, to develop. Then another part, which is the H&M Foundation, and H&M Foundation is a total financial separated uh, uh, entity from the H&M Group. So uh, we don't have that kind of connection. Uh, so if another brand reaches out to H&M Foundation, they have to give them the same information as they give to us. Uh, but they have something that we are uh, using quite a lot, the Global Change Award. All, and this is a uh, con uh, competition where you can apply for one year uh, incubation uh, with a vast network of industry players and also some funding for your projects to develop. Uh, and we are, of course, talking to all the winners and many of the applicants uh, that are um, uh, applying for this Global Change Award. And while they are also uh, attending to that, we are able to start up projects to develop their materials and their processes. So wherever you are in your process, we are able to keep the contact with the different players in this area, uh, which means when they're ready, we are able to support them in the best possible way, whether it's equity investments, whether it's a project, uh, <coughs> sorry, whether it's a project where, where we develop or uh, help them to evaluate their, their products, uh, or if it's time for a small collection to put it on the market, to put it on a real trial. So in our projects, the thing we do is basically to take it from lab scale into bulk scale. That's our aim. And we realize that when you work in Petri dish volume uh, in a lab, uh, with uh, professors and PhD students, the cost is quite high uh, for these materials. Uh, and we are fine with that. Uh, we, can, we, we can handle that kind of cost. But we need to see in the long run 
that the cost is coming down and reaching relevant price points. Uh, and uh, in this case, we're looking at, it, uh, at uh, what kind of feedstock are you using? Are you using uh, uh, conventional production equipment? Uh, is the feedstock available at a global level and so on? Uh, another thing is that almost anything can be produced in a lab, uh, which means that yeah, everything is possible. It's a totally different ballgame to move that into industrial production. Uh, and this is also something we're trying to help these companies uh, to do. To have industrial partners or our supply chain to help them, uh, or find ways to scale up into industrial scale. Because a lot of hurdles will uh, be present on that, on that journey. Uh, another thing we look at is that in the beginning, uh, most of these companies are uh, positioned at in larger cities in Europe, North America, uh, or uh, Asia. Uh, but for us to have them uh, as a relevant supplier of raw materials and uh, our feedstock, uh, we need to have them at global scale and global availability. Is it possible to set up this production on a global scale? And of course, in the beginning, we can produce small patches of, of fabric. Uh, we work with everything from a couple of grams of fibers up to two, three hundred kilos of fibers so that we can make a small collection. Uh, but the most important part for us is that we can evaluate something that we call hand feel. And this is uh, very uh, very unspecific, uh, unscientific value. Uh, which is used on a daily basis within the H&M group. Uh, it's when we come with the material. And you can... I, I would love to say that the degree of polymerization is the best measurement, uh, whether it's a good fiber or not. But we can't say that. We need to create uh, yarn, we need to create a fabric that is matching, uh, and we need to put that on the table to show it to our designers and product developers. They will then pick it up, use their fingers and evaluate the hand feel, which is very difficult to specify in an early stage. Uh, so, but that's, that's reality, and that's something we need to take into consideration uh, when we start developing these fibers as well. Uh, another thing we realized starting up, uh, we, we saw the um, innovation evolu evolution, uh, and Basically, we have quite a lot of companies uh, down in lab scale. Companies, research institutes, universities. Uh, there are a lot of good ideas out there. And we are quite, and have been historically quite good at monitoring these. Uh, we have our brands constantly monitoring the, the, the uh, innovations coming out. Uh, we have CoLab uh, investing in these companies. Uh, we have ourselves. Uh, and we, we have quite good, uh, a quite good view of what kind of innovations are out there. Uh, in the other part of the scale, the bulk scale, we are quite good as well. We have a mature um, organization to take care of large volume uh, and to procure that. Uh, and in this part, I mean, you need all the certificates, you need all the global availability, you need the price points and everything else. What we haven't been that good at is supporting these companies in between lab scale until they reach bulk scale. And this is what we're trying to do now. We try to support them while they have very low volumes of uh, pricey materials uh, until they are more ready to increase the volumes still at high prices. But if we can support them during their journey, I think they are able to scale up much faster. And this is also where you build your pilot factory to prove to the industry that this is working. Uh, this is a process that we could scale. Uh, and also, this is a product that has a demand on the market. And that's also what we can help and support the innovators with, to have that connection to the end customer. Uh, and this might take 10 to 15 years. Uh, to reach from lab scale into industrial scale. Uh, and that's a very long time. Uh, and our goals are 2030, we have also 2040 goals, but we need to start now. 
in order for us to achieve our goals. Uh, and hopefully we can decrease uh, this amount of time, but it's quite difficult to build up uh, a new industry uh, around a new fiber. So uh, we need all the support we can have and the innovators need all the support we can give them. Uh, also the demand, what kind of demand do we have as H&M Group? This is our uh, 2021 uh, H&M Group material basket. And as you can see, the main portion of that is cotton. So about 62% that we use is cotton. 20% is polyester. Uh, then we have 5.6% wood and MMCF. Uh, and then we have a, a couple of other materials like leather, wool, uh, nylon and so on. So what are we doing in these different areas? For cotton, for example, which is the most important material for us, we are working quite a lot with uh, organic cotton. We are also supporting in-conversion cotton, uh, which means that farmers that want to uh, uh, remake their production of cotton from conventional cotton into organic cotton, it takes like four years about. Uh, during that time, we support them by buying from those farms in order for them to do that transition, because they will lose money, they will lose um, yield in their production and so on. So that's a way to support them into taking the right decisions. We also have Better Cotton Initiative, uh, which is an organization that is monitoring and helping farmers to grow cotton in a more res responsible way. Uh, we also try to re use more recycled content in the cotton. That's what we're doing uh, right now. What we're doing on the innovation side, we're looking into, are we able to produce cotton in a different way? Do we need the plant or, or could we produce it in a lab? Uh, and of course, the lab is just the first phase. We need to move that into industrial as well. But it is actually possible to produce cotton in a lab, in a petri dish as well. Uh, then we are supporting future farming solutions. Uh, we're looking into different uh, ways of farming in India, for example. Uh, looking into the hydroponic solutions, where you distribute water and nutrients in the exact amount that is needed to grow the plant, uh, instead of watering the whole field. Uh, and we're also using tents to uh, reduce the use of pesticides, for example. So that's also a way to look into new solutions where we can, uh, where we can uh, use um, innovations. Of course, one of the biggest problems uh, with cotton is the recycling. Today we have mechanical recycling, which is uh, a good way to recycle cotton, but it's not a good way to keep the quality of the cotton, because the fiber length will decrease by each cycle. Uh, that's a real challenge for us, to decrease the degradation of the cotton during this process. Uh, and then we have another interesting part, and that's the alternative materials. Because, to be honest, we are not looking for viscose, uh, we're looking for cotton. And if you can't have cotton, we're looking for cotton-like materials that could be derived from uh, other wood-based, for example, uh, feedstocks. But we need to have something that is more cotton-like than viscose, because our customers doesn't demand uh, an increase uh, in this 5.6%. They they're looking for more cotton or cotton-like materials. And that's the important part for us as well. When it comes to polyester, uh, we are increasing the recycled content. And of course, we're trying to move away. Today, most recycled polyester is from PET bottles. Uh, this is not a favorable solution long term, because we don't want to take something from a perfect system where you have PET bottles going in circles, uh, being recycled in the same way. Uh, making garments out of that, where we don't really have the recycling scheme to get it into the system again. So we're trying to increase the use of textile to textile recycling polyester uh, instead of PET bottles. Uh, we're also supporting innovations in this kind. Uh, textile to textile recycling, we have quite a lot of different projects uh, and we're trying to set up the projects according to the full chain. 
So we're looking into how do we collect, how do we sort these textiles, because they need to be sorted, uh, and hopefully not manually, but automated, uh, so that we're able to get uh, vast volumes of these recycled textiles into our recycling processes. And there are quite a lot of steps on the way before we can hand it over to a recycler saying that here is a polyester rich content textile post-consumer waste that you can use because it needs shredding, you need to remove trims, you need to remove metals and other contaminations and then you have the yield. I mean the most, the most uh, uh, used material today is, is polycotton. It's a blend of polyester and cotton. And how do we separate those two without destroying uh, either one of them? And today we're able to uh, remove the polyester, but then we practically destroy the cotton. Uh, so we're trying to find solutions for this and to, to try the full cycle uh, of our materials as well. Uh, alternatives feedstocks, uh, we're looking into bio-based but also biodegradable feedstocks for, for polyester alternatives. Uh, and of course, I mean, there's a huge problem with microfibers shedding from, from textiles when washing them. Uh, if we could use uh, biodegradable materials, it would be great, of course. Uh, we also need to look into what is biodegradable? Uh, is it industrial biodegradability or will it degrade in seawater? Uh, will it degrade once uh, we have used uh, different dye stuff and chemical treatments on it? Uh, how does that affect the biodegradability? So it's not an easy task, I would say. You can say that the fiber is biodegradable. It doesn't mean that the garment is biodegradable. So that's also something we're looking into quite a lot. Uh, we have quite a lot of projects going into textile to textile viscose. How do we take care of the viscose uh, once we have put it on the market? There are quite a lot of viscose out there. Uh, we are creating quite a lot of new uh, man made cellulosic fibers. How do we take care and recycle those fibers once they are coming back? Uh, because we will never say that something is compostable to our customers, because we don't want to. Uh, give them the opportunity to throw away the garments. We, want, we, we don't want to see it as waste. We want to see it as a resource that we can put in to the circular system again, so we can use it again and again. Uh, we're also looking into other sus more sustainable processes within uh, the MMCF uh, process, of course. Uh, we have other materials such as um, leather, for example. We have a lot of mycelium-based uh, leathers that we're evaluating. We're looking into fermentation quite a lot. Uh, how do we ferment the feedstock to be used for future fiber production? Uh, Protein-based fibers, what are we able to do with those? Uh, can we make something like wool or could we do something else with these protein-based uh, fibers? Uh, also, the sorting for recycling, uh, looking into different projects on how to automatically sort uh, these fibers or these garments coming into our systems. Uh, and also using enzymes to break down different blends of materials. So, my last slide is basically our material innovation needs. Uh, and we have several. Uh, I have put this together for, for this occasion, since it's uh, quite cellulosic based today. Uh, we will always promote that we need more cotton, uh, or alternatives to cotton. So, alternative ways to produce cotton. Uh, recycling of cotton without quality loss. Are we able to do something about these fibers to prolong them, or are we even able to increase the quality when recycling them? Uh, methods of separating co cotton and polyester, as I've been mentioning as well. Uh, then the arrows are quite wrong here, I think. Uh, the arrow from the viscose shirt should be going to the sugar for fer fermentation part. So what are we able to do with the viscose coming out uh, on the market? Uh, are we able to do MMCF with cotton qualities out of it? 
are we able to detect these new materials in automated sorting, like near-infrared spectroscopy, for example? Uh, could we use uh, feedstock from, from forests to, to create polyester-based fibers or polyester-like fibers? Uh, feedstock for elastic fibers, are we able to uh, remove the elastane from the market by adding something from the forest instead? Uh, Cellulosic-based surface treatments. We're always looking after surface treatments uh, that are relevant. Cellulosic-based alternatives to plastic, of course, packaging and and um, yeah, all the accessories that we use. We have quite a lot of different product types in our assortment. So I wanted to leave you with this picture uh, and. Uh, I'm quite humbled to stand in front of this crowd of knowledge. It's uh, a lot of people with great knowledge in this room. And I hope the solutions are out there. Uh, we are ready to support them uh, if you contact us and if you have a relevant product that we can help you to evaluate or to discuss or if you need any input on what kind of future needs we see on the market and so on. Uh, and I think we'll have questions afterwards as well. So, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you. I think you have triggered a lot of questions in the audience, and I, can, I think we can entertain those. I have que a question already, but maybe very naive. Is wood the next cotton? Um, Maybe, maybe not, I don't know, but that will be one, one question that we can entertain. Now I'm very pleased to, to introduce the next speaker, uh, Dirk uh, Bantigem, uh, who comes from Aerotex. Uh, he's, uh, since three years ago, Director General of a Confederation of the Apparel and Textiles Industries in Europe. And uh, he will bring the perspective of strategies in the European Union. So a different angle, very important to consider, is part of the equation that we need to entertain here. So welcome, uh, Dirk. Thank you. I have two. Let's try. Yes. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you, Orlando, for the nice introduction, and thank you uh, to the Foundation for inviting um, me, Uratex, to, to be part of this very festive celebration, uh, also last night. And congratulations first to the uh, laureates um, for the work that they have carried out. And maybe a special congratulations to the young researchers which are in the room, which were you know, displaying their posters, because from a European textile perspective, we need more young researchers working on textiles. So I'm happy to see many young people in this room, and I can only encourage you to continue working uh, to the benefit of the textile um, industry. Um, <clears throat> what I would like to do in the next 15 minutes or so is, is indeed to explain to you, to share with you how Europe, how the European Union is developing a new framework for the textile industry. How Brussels is reshaping the way we will, do, we will do business in the next 10, 20, 30 years. And the short answer is there's a lot of change coming. Uh, and I'll try to keep it um, short and simple, let's say. Um, <clears throat> before that, just uh, one slide of introduction of the organization that I indeed joined three years ago. So we are basically the official representation of the entire textile and apparel industry in Europe uh, towards the European Union. So our job, my job is to promote, defend, fight sometimes for the interest of the textile industry um, in, in Brussels. You can see the numbers there. So it's the EU 27 member states, but it's also Norway, Switzerland, Turkey, UK, who are part of the Euratex um, family. And we have the entire, let's say, supply, the entire value chain represented in our industry. So from the fiber makers, um, whether these are man-made fibers, synthetic fibers, all of them, down to the final product, whether this is fashion, apparel, 
uh, whether it's technical textiles, um, medical textiles, um, home textiles, so it's all part of the Eurotex um, family. And once again, our job is to, to work with the policy makers to overall make sure that this European textile industry at large remains competitive, um, remains strong. We do not, just to be clear, directly at least, we do not directly represent the brands, the retailers, although I should say there is an increasingly close cooperation, um, very necessary, um, between the manufacturers and the retailers and the brands, as you were actually showing in your presentation uh, about the, the initiatives you are taking from H&M. So there is more and more cooperation also with the, uh, with the retailers. So let's, let's focus on this EU textile strategy. So a few months ago, the European Commission has published an official communication, they call it, um, EU strategy for sustainable and circular textiles. It's quite unique that the Commission, European Commission is publishing, is developing and publishing an official plan, because that's what it is, uh, for a dedicated, for a specific sector. It doesn't happen every 10 years. It doesn't happen every 20 years. Um, <clears throat> they released this on the 30th of March, and I will take you through the, the, main, the, main, the main elements. Why is there a, a dedicated strategy? Why did the Commission, who has a lot of things to do, a lot of priorities, why did they spend time with the Commission, with the member states involved, um, why did they spend time to, to develop this, this vision um, for our industry? Um, there are three, three reasons. The first one is obviously linked to sustainability. Um, everybody, well, I think most of you are familiar with the European Green Deal. Uh, so this European Commission focusing, pushing very much to reduce the environmental impact of the industry, of society at large. Mr. Franz Timmermans, the Vice President, you may have seen him, the man with the beard in Brussels, um, is managing this Green Deal. And that translates into a lot of legislative initi initiatives across different sectors, across different activities. And textiles obviously gets into the picture. You know the saying, textiles is the third, fourth most polluting sector. You can discuss, but we, we do have an environmental impact as an industry. So when the Commission is rolling out this Green Deal, automatically they fell into the textile sector and saying, guys, what, what are we going to do to reduce your environmental footprint? So that's the first and very important foundation for this textile strategy. Second, though, um, this Commission is also trying, I should say, trying to um, strengthen um, the industrial base in Europe, trying to um, reduce our dependency on external supplies. You may remember the story of the face masks, also probably here. Um, and so there is a, a plan, an industrial strategy, that has identified 14 what they call strategic sectors of the European economy, where Europe says we need to invest, we need to innovate, we need to support those 14 sectors. And you can see textiles, we can read it, is one of those 14. So in other words, the Commission is saying, guys, you're, you have an environmental problem, but at the same time is saying textiles is important. And we want the textile industry in Europe to remain, to be competitive, to be resilient. A third element under, under, uh, let's say underlying this, this strategy is the Commission or this European Union has changed, let's say, or is evolving its relations with third countries. Changed from uh, traditionally the EU being very free trade focused, without questions asked, I would say, towards a more critical relationship with our third countries partners. Thinking of China, thinking of what happens in Myanmar, things what happens in Brazil with the forests, etc. So the EU is becoming more critical um, and is therefore adapting its trade policy, its relations with those third countries to be a bit more, as it's mentioned there, assertive, so a bit more critical. 
And that, again, has an impact on the textile industry. You know that textiles is officially the second most globalized sector of the European economy, um, with strong, intense supply chains. So, as the Commission has step by step changed its trade policy, so its foreign relations, you may know but free trade agreements with India that are in the pipeline, GSP, I don't know if there are trade experts here in the room. So that has an impact on also the textile um, industry. So based on, let's say, those three main tendencies, um, the Commission published this um, strategy. And I just want to go through those, those five boxes because they really summarize the essence of what is the vision, so where does Europe want to go um, in, the, in the next few years. Um, so please read with me the first box. So the EU vision is to say that all textile products placed on the EU market, so regardless where they are produced, all placed on the EU market, are durable, repairable, recyclable. To a great extent made of recycled fibers, free of hazardous substances, so chemicals, produced respecting social rights. That's what the Commission wants to see happening. So these type of textile products should become the reference, should become the norm on, this, on the EU single market. And it was interesting to hear your presentation, the H&M targets, they fit within, within that plan. So H&M has a good intelligence, obviously. Um, but it's important. It shows that companies, retailers, large retailers, already anticipate what is the vision of the Commission. So it's a very strong statement, and I will explain in a minute. It's not just words. This will become law, rules, restrictions. Huh? So it's not a nice idea somewhere in a, you know, developed by a bureaucrat in Brussels. It's, it's hard legislation. Second, um, it's a slogan. It's not, to be very clear, it's not the Eurotex slogan, because sometimes people confuse. It's the slogan of Vice President Franz Timmermans, Vice President of the Commission, when he said, fast fashion is out of fashion. Sounds good, no? In, as a politician, to say this. Um, consumers benefit longer from high-quality textiles. The same idea. So to move away from this quick buy something, wear it once, throw it away. So durability becomes the norm. Reuse and repair services becoming widely available. So you wear something, there's something broken, instead of throwing it away, set up a, a, an industry that takes back, repairs, reuse, etc. Um, number four, which is very important for us, of course, representing the industry, um, to have a competitive, resilient and innovative textile sector where producers take responsibility for their products along the value chain. That means due diligence, that means uh, we need to know how that jacket has been made. Where does the um, fabric come from? Um, how was it made? Where does the yarn, where does the fibre come from? And some of you are familiar, there are very political, complex discussions on the origin of fibres, for example. Um, but again, it's important that the Commission recognises that we need to have this competitive, resilient, innovative textile sector. And then number five, and it was mentioned, I think uh, you mentioned this this morning, um, moving away from this traditional linear business model towards a circular business model. That's very much the bottom line. So move away from, you know, you produce something to, with your supply chain, you use it and you throw it away, you burn it, whatever. We move into a circular business model. So circular, rather than throw away clothes, have become the norm with sufficient capacities for recycling and minimal, minimal incineration. So this capacity issue is indeed a big, as a, a big problem. How do we develop and generate sufficient recycled material um, to produce all the textiles and garments that we need in Europe and, and worldwide? So this is the kind of the, the main five topics, and I think you find that clear enough. Um, but what is important is that that vision is being translated into legislation as we speak. Um, and on the slide, I 
it's a summary, it's not even the full list um, of regulations that are being discussed. Um, and I'll try to keep it short, but so under this regulatory framework, the first and most important is the eco-design regulation. I don't know if you have heard about this. This is a piece of legislation that will basically decide how you produce your textile products in terms of composition, um, the quality, uh, the standards that you will have to comply with, the durability, um, that will, inf in, in for, in, will force you sorry, to adapt your information and communication uh, of your product, the transparency, the traceability. So it basically will force you to produce your products in a different way than uh, you might do today. Um, there is big negotiations going on on what is called the product environmental footprint. I don't know if some of you are familiar with the concept of PEF. Very, very difficult discussions. It's trying to set an objective reference. Um, what is the environmental footprint of a T-shirt? And if that T-shirt is made from cotton or from polyester or from some other material, how do you measure that? Uh, what what we try to do in this PEF is to set a benchmark to say the reference T-shirt um, envir environmental footprint is X. Getting to this X is very, very complicated. The cotton people will push the, 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 the framework in one direction, the polyester people will push it in another direction. And I can tell you there's big discussions involving some of the brands very much. But the idea, the ambition is to have an objective, as objective as possible, reference. To avoid confusion about what is now, what has the bigger environmental impact um, than something else. Um, there's a lot of discussion, more than discussion, preparation to introduce an EPR system, an extended producer responsibility. It's a kind of a tax People don't like to use, to, to use that word, but it's a levy. When, I, when you buy an, uh, um, a textile product, a garment, there will be an additional levy on that product um, that should be used to finance, I would say, the whole recycling and reusability of apparel products. It already exists in France. If you go to France and you buy a T-shirt, you pay 10 euro plus a few cents, and those few cents are collected and put into an organization, which is called Refashion, which is, f I would say, managing, coordinating the whole recycling of all the garment textile products in, in France. There will be compulsory an EPR in every member state, also here in Sweden. Um, and it's a big discussion, how much will that tax be? Who will collect it? And for what will it be used? Is it additional income for the, for the government to fill their deficit? Or can it be used by the industry to indeed finance um, recyclability, innovation, etc., etc., in the making? There's legislation on due diligence, so more than before, um, companies are responsible for what happens in your supply chain, starting from the brand to the fiber. Eh? Um, the Commission would like to have every single textile product to have a unique identifier, a unique passport, a digital product passport it's called. A lot of discussions, how can we do that? Millions of products, um, but discussion is ongoing. <laughs> Working on the microplastics, it was mentioned before, um, try to reduce chemicals, big fights on, on uh, certain chemicals. Try to address overproduction, so brands, I'm sure you know it, will be held responsible for um, products produced but not sold. So they will have to declare which part of H&M, sorry to always use H&M, but you are here, which part of H&M um, volume has not been sold. They will need to declare, and obviously that will put pressure on H&M to reduce overproduction, to make sure that we don't have this, you know, um, overproduction. They also want to use a new eco-label. I know we have uh, too many labels already, but the Commission dreams to have a more simple 
um, tool of information towards the consumer. Um, so, like in electronic appliances, A, B, C, D, E, you know that, also here in, in Sweden, they dream to have something similar for textiles. How that would work, nobody knows, but there is compulsory textile waste collection already today. And so by 2025, you can no longer throw away your, your products. We cannot ship them anymore to Africa. So we need to manage, as Europeans, our own textile waste. And we've, as Eurotex, we've done big studies with the help of a consultancy. We will have between eight and nine million tons of textile waste in a few years. How are we going to manage that? How are we going to turn that waste into value? We have a project called the Rehabs, on which where we're working with the industry to turn that problem into an opportunity. That's a different discussion. So a lot of legislation, actually there is more uh, that is in the making and that will be rolled out in the next, let's say, between two and five years. So it's going to take a while because it's very complicated, it's very technical, it's very political sometimes, uh, but it is coming. And again, um, the, the direction, I hope, I think is clear. Quickly, along with all that legislation, there is also what we call a transition pathway. It's a nice Brussels bubble word. It's basically um, the commission with, with, with the industry is developing um, a plan, like a work plan, to accompany that whole transition. So to, to make sure that the industry, the, the sector as a whole, can make that transition while remain uh, more or less competitive. That's the plan. So there's a lot of work on, on resilience, so really studying what are the elements of resilience for the European textile industry, um, how can we support that. There's a lot of discussion on maintaining the level playing field, making sure that if European industry is moving up the bar in terms of quality, durability, etc., probably also costs, how do we make sure that our European companies can remain competitive vis-à-vis uh, -vis global um, competitors out there? Um, market surveillance. Again, the idea is that every product placed on the EU on the single market will comply with chemical use, etc. We import 25 billion pieces of apparel every year in the EU. 25 billion. How are we going to control 25 billion pieces? Big question mark. Um, we need to work on that. But so, this pathway is all about, again, more the operational side. It's about investment in innovation, what you said before again, uh, the need to invest uh, in new technologies, new fiber applications, skills, so attracting young generation to work for the textile industry, um, make sure they have the right skills. It's all about, you know, as we call it in Brussels, making this green and digital transition. Um, I'm almost there, so this is just, um, if you want, the industry perspective. So from Euratex, on behalf of the industry, how we look at this whole transition. Can it work? Or how to make it work? I mean, that's the... How to make it work without destroying the European textile industry. I mean, that's the bottom line. Um, and this, this summarizes a little bit our, our vision. First of all, this regulatory framework is okay. As an industry, to be very honest, some of my members, entrepreneurs, are a little bit reluctant. They see all these rules coming from Brussels and they say, ah, oh, Dick, too many rules. The textile industry is moving from an unregulated to a regulated sector that we need to understand. And some people don't like it for political, philosophical reasons, but this is happening. We are being regulated much more than before. So what we say is that to make sure that the, that the quality of that regulation is critically important. Meaning, um, if we set the bar high, is it high enough to be ambitious, but is not too high so that companies cannot achieve those standards? If the Commission would say, we want from, in five years, all apparel products to be made from recycled material. It's nonsense, because there's not enough recycled material out there. So that's what I mean. We need to have a very close, and we are having a close dialogue with the regulator, 
to make sure that this framework, this new framework, is realistic, is enforceable. For example, they say we will ban 1,000 chemical products. You can no longer use 1,000 chemical products. But in fact, we don't know how to control it. Then we have a problem. If you put in a regulation that you will not, that upfront you will say we will not be able to, con to control, why do you issue the regulation? SME friendly, coherent, etc. So the quality of that framework will be critically important. Second, we are as an industry pushing and pleading for support. Um, the European textile industry is 90% more SMEs. Uh, it's, it, everybody knows the, the larger brands, clearly, but the producers behind, if I may say so, uh, it's not lensing, it's many, many small, medium-sized, family-owned companies who do not have the resources to invest in, in you know, uh, green technology, in digitalization, in uh, reskilling their people. So we are discussing actually with the Commission a, a what we call a textile transition fund. So basically a big program that would help those companies, you know, with financial support, with investment in research and innovation, um, in people. By the way, in energy, if I may, our biggest problem today, regardless of all this, is energy. Maybe less so in Sweden, but in the rest of Europe, and you probably follow the news in Brussels, it's our biggest problem. Some of our textile companies today are closing down because they can't pay the energy bill anymore. Closing down and relocating to Turkey, into Asia. So this whole reshoring trend that was happening because of the energy crisis is, is, is pulled back in a way. It's a side comment. So, second, uh, we need that uh, support. And then thirdly, very, very important, we need to make sure there is a demand for sustainable textile products. If consumers don't want to buy and don't want to often pay a, a premium for a sustainable product, it stops. We're finished. You know, we can, as, as, as industry, we can be committed uh, to produce um, more sustainable fabrics, products. The regulator can create a beautiful framework if there is no market, if there is no demand, what do we do? So here, we need to work a lot with the brands, with the retailers. We need to inform the consumers. Uh, we need to be more transparent, more clear, maybe simple in our communication. Um, but there's a big, big effort to make sure that the consumers come on board. And we need to address the price problem, the cost um, of sustainable products, especially in today's economic situation. I think we all know how consumers suffer from inflation. Um, it's very delicate to, to tell the consumer you, shall, you have to buy you know, a, a jeans that was made of sustainable fabrics uh, if it costs 10, 20, 30 percent more. If that same consumer has you know, challenges to manage his or her budget. So we need to be very, very careful on that. But it's something we need to work on. Also on public procurement. The authorities are a big client for textiles. The army, police force, fireware, uh, hospitals. And yes, we should be, should be green, but when it comes to procurement, very often the one criteria that matters most is the price. So there is a legislation on the table, green public procurement, so that it's not just the price, but it's also you know, the sustainability of the product that is important. So, Good regulation, support to the industry, and make sure there is demand in a global context. Again, what I mentioned before, um, we have to be very careful as European industry, as European society, um, not to create a beautiful framework, a beautiful kind of setting, um, if it means that we become uh, less competitive towards our com competitors sorry, outside Europe, we are in trouble, and that we the risk is that we would destroy our, um, our industry. So we have to be very, very careful about that. Voilà. Um, final slide is what does all this mean on, on wood-based textiles? I'll, I'll keep it very short. Um, as it's been mentioned before, 6% of fibres, according to the, the, the statistics I received, 
Um, so there is a big, a great potential for sure for um, man-made cellulosics to increase their share in the use of fibers used. And I just want to leave that slide here. If you look at those words that I just throw together, uh, what I mentioned before, durability, eco-design, recyclability, bio-based, these are the, um, the buzzwords that are included in, in the textile strategy, in that vision. And I think wood-based uh, um, fibers fit perfectly in that, in that strategy. So my very short, simple conclusion is that I think even though Eurotex is fiber neutral, I should say, uh, but I think there is a great potential for um, wood-based uh, fibers in the, as part of this, um, of this strategy. Well, stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dirk. A lot of insights, a lot of <coughs> things uh, to think about. Very important component, especially one of the components that uh, you discuss, consuming behavior, consumer perception, very important. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce the next speaker, um, um, Niklas von Weinmann, who comes from uh, Metza Spring. He's CEO of uh, Mesa Spring. He's also sitting in the board of a company that is an uh, alliance with a Japanese uh, company as well uh, called Woodio. So welcome, Niklas. You can bring the forest perspective and the techno-economic scalability issues that are equally important. So welcome, Niklas. <music> Thank you, Orlando, and I apologize for the difficult surnames we have here today. <laughs> I usually are the one who, who faces this, but today we have a, a few more. Also, thank you to the Foundation for inviting me and my wife to this really great event. It has been really nice, and, and also thank you for the opportunity to talk about one important aspect. So we are talking about producing fibers from wood. And uh, my presentation will focus on uh, uh, the fact that, that what would a big company uh, considering investing in a production plant think about this? So I come from a big company and I'm going to, in this short presentation, go through some of the uh, things we are looking for when we are considering does it make sense to invest in this production or not? And I think that is eventually then the uh, most critical thing when we have all the science in place. Very briefly about the background. So I come from a company called Metsa Group. Metsa is Finnish and stands for forest, so forest group, if you may. And uh, the parent company of Metsa Group is a cooperative. So if you look for a Swedish company, which uh, is, is almost the same uh, structure uh, in terms of ownership, it's Södra Skogsägarna. We have uh, about the double of these so-called owner members in our uh, cooperative. But uh, nevertheless, uh, my work uh, is innovation and Metsa Group has an innovation company since about four years, which is called Metsa Spring, and I'm heading uh, that company. We have a quite a unique position to push forward potential innovations, but we do have to focus on such innovations, potential innovations, which fit the Metsa Group industrial or business ecosystem. So as we are not using, for instance, any eucalyptus in our ecosystem, we cannot look at any in potential innovations linked to, to eucalyptus. We have three ways of operating, uh, pushing forward these potential innovations. One is to invest in small startup companies, helping them onwards. The second is the fact that we can also operate our own development projects. And finally, we also help the existing businesses of Metsa Group in terms of research and development. So this is the portfolio. Today we have five big projects uh, and obviously one focusing on wood-based textile fibers, which is the topic of today. But we have also uh, other quite interesting uh, uh, potential innovations in the portfolio. And I will, in my next slide, talk about the demo, 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 pilot, pilot. What does that really mean? Uh, I think that is quite important to understand. And please remember that 
most people, they might have their own definition of this, but uh, at least I, I watched uh, Herbert's uh, presentation here in the morning and, and he was using it in the same way uh, as I am here trying to explain it. So this <coughs> graph is, of course, a very simplified part. But uh, yeah, and I've cut out the whole lab phase, which we talked about earlier today. But obviously that is typically needed when you are aiming to develop a new production process from zero. You start in the lab at some point. But our activity in Metsa Spring uh, comes uh, alive when you start to think about a pilot plant and then move forward to a demo plant and hopefully all the way to a first commercial, commercial plant. So what's the difference in, in my head between these? Well, if put, to put it very simple, uh, when I talk about the pilot plant, it's a, it's a facility with machinery bigger than lab, but the machinery is like in the industry. So they are the same, as we call unit processes, same equipment as used in industry, but much smaller. You are typically not operating the whole pilot plant as a continuous process. When you go to demo, I think that's one of the main uh, differences. So a demo is typically built so that you can operate it for weeks to see what happens in the long run. I like sailing and one way of trying to explain this using a sailboat. So imagine that you have a sailing boat and, and you want to go for a, a trip with the family, including teenagers. So if you go to the pilot plant sailing, it's like an afternoon of sailing or one day of sailing, and then we go back, we dock the boat, and everybody goes to their rooms and no problem. You might not even use the toilet in the boat and so on. So you don't see many of the problems, which you would see if you then go to the demo plant sailing, which could be a month with your family. Day and night in this small boat, the toilet might be clogging. I didn't know that. You have to solve it, and so on, and so on. The teenagers fight. There's a lot of, not so much space, and so on. So you need to uh, go to this scale to, to understand what kind of problems you might eventually have. And still, you won't know what happens when you run the production plant for a year, because you are not operating the demo plant continuously for a year. So you are still left with some of the risks when you go to the first commercial uh, plant. But this is a way of handling, mitigating the risk in scaling up. So one of uh, the first part of my title of this presentation was scaling up. So this is scaling up a production process. So I promised some views on how we uh, look at a potential new in investment. So this is the basics. If you want to produce something, you want to make sure that you have the raw material, first of all. Uh, you need to have an availability of the raw material, but the price of the raw materials also very important. And in some cases now, when we put this into the context of this uh, wood-based textile fiber, you need to, uh, the, the available pulp on the market is not directly fitting your process, so you need to to think about tailoring it before you use it in your production process. Then obviously you have to have the actual production process with the roof and walls. And as you want the production process uh, in this kind of business to run almost a full year, you might have one week of, of uh, shutdown when you are making repairs, but otherwise 355 days, day and night, it's operating. So you need to make sure that the process, all bits and pieces are robust. They, they really can handle some small changes and so on. When you are considering investing, you need two more things. You need somebody who can engineer or design the actual production plant. And it's not so easy when you go to a completely new field. There are no competencies in the engineering companies. And then you need the equipment suppliers, again, as nobody has built a, a production process like this, there are no uh, equipment suppliers who can say, my equipment works exactly like this in this application. So the, so the uh, burden of, uh, of making sure that the process works is on the company, not on the equipment supplier in the first uh, case. Then obviously you have to have a good product. 
So you need to have a uh, demand for the product uh, and you also need to have the appropriate quality so that you get a good price for the product. And Herbert was showing nicely how this ion cell uh, fiber is in, in relation to, to existing products. Very good position in that respect. But you also need the means to get to the market. If Metza Group would now start producing this fiber, we have no people who know how to sell the product on the market. We have no distribution chains to ship the product to different places and so on. So we have to think about that as well. Well, this is still fairly simple. Then you need to think about the permits. You need to have most likely an environmental permit. Uh, you need to have uh, uh, think about the, the chemical side, the chemical safety permits and so on. You need to look at the patents. You need to understand, do I have freedom to operate in this world of, of existing patents? You need to have the people, uh, both for the investment phase, that's one kind of competence to build the factories, but then also the ones who are operating the one. Now we think about Finland and Sweden, we don't have this kind of operations in, in Finland and Sweden, for instance. So who would be the, the ones who operate? We have to educate these people in good time. And again, a demo plant is quite important here. Then you need a site, obviously. This takes quite a lot of land to, to build. You need to have the financing, you have to go to the banks, uh, obviously, you need to have your own uh, equity, but also the, the banks are involved. You need to convince them they are looking at similar things as here. Typically, the first question the, the, the top boss is asking is profitability. So you have to make sure that this all, when you make the investment, you can pay back the investment. And finally, there might be then other things that, that you compete with. For instance, in this uh, wood-based textile fibers, we, there is one very strong NGO pushing for adding recycled material. So you need to have their stamp, which is actually a green shirt, if you are on, in the top uh, category. And, and many of the customers are looking for this green shirt stamp when you are selling the textile fibers. And then the textile strategy. What is going to happen in five years in Europe? You have to understand that as well. I'm sorry, this will be the most technical slide, uh, but because my presentation title also included techno-economics, I, I do have one slide about the technical aspects of uh, going to, to a market. Uh, so this is my term, direct dissolution, and Her Herbert also used it in the morning, so we talk about the same uh, concept, production concept here. So as I pointed out, uh, for this process, one of uh, the big questions is the availability, especially of the base component of the ionic liquid. So you can buy it on small scale, but not on large scale. So we have to work to have the base component, whatever the base component eventually is, we have to work to have that availability, and rather from two than one supplier. We have to work on the recycling rate of this solvent, because it's fairly expensive. So you have to be in the 99 or even above uh, rates to, to be profitable. Uh, you need to uh, make sure that uh, this uh, solvent, whatever you choose, is stable. We heard from uh, uh, morning's presentation that in MMO you use quite a lot of stabilizers. So you need to study this part. And this really impacts the frequency of changing the spinneret. So imagine this kind of a, a box which through you are pushing the dope and then you have the nice filaments coming out as in the morning videos and at some point it will clog and you need to replace it and if you have like 500 of those and you need people to do it so the frequency of changing if you do it every five hours or every week it's a huge difference you need to study that uh, the product properties again uh, Herbert did uh, point out these earlier this morning, uh, very important from a technical perspective to reach these goals. Uh, whiteness could be especially in non-woven area, uh, a key criteria, uh, and, and the mechan mechanical things and fibrillation was mentioned. Then you have to understand, especially based on the demo plant, what's your product output? So you are investing in a certain amount of hardware, 
equipment, you need to know how much product is coming out per year. And uh, obviously, if you uh, push the machines in a, on a medium level, you might get very good quality product out. But then if you go to full speed, the quality goes down. So you need to really understand what is the maximum you can produce. You need to make sure that every time you produce, the product is the same. And finally, uh, I, I would say most importantly, you, may, you, you need to make sure that, that the chemicals and whatever you are using are safe for the workers and for the environment. So this is really important. So then to the actual uh, economics of this part. So um, to put it very simple, uh, you have to invest first money to build a factory and we call it CAPEX, capital expenditure. So you have to make an investment. And then you have the income from selling the fiber, which is the positive, and then you have the cost of producing, which is the negative, and hopefully the positive is bigger than the negative, so that you can pay back the capex from the beginning. So this is really important. At the moment, it is very expensive to build. Not only the energy, but all the materials have gone up uh, the, the time, delivery times are really long and so on. So this is not a good time exactly now to build. So you need to also understand the cycles in construction, where is a good uh, moment uh, to, to invest. In terms of the income, the positive, uh, if you do a profitability calculation and, and see how sensitive it is, you will find that the most sensitive factor is the price of the product. So if you get 2.5 or 3, it's a huge difference. So you have to really understand what is the product price. And again, from our perspective, we have to also consider the fact that if I, I use somebody to sell the product, I have to pay that, that company as well. So the, I cannot use the end product price in my calculations. On the cost side, uh, uh, the largest single uh, component is the price of pulp, the, the main raw material. So you have to work on, on that. Number one, uh, uh, sorry, number two in terms of cost today is energy. And it might now be even more significant due to the prices, especially in, in Central Europe, we see. In Finland and, and Sweden, we have more possibilities to integrate and have own energy production. So that could be a, a, a competitive edge. And uh, then uh, finally, the personnel cost is also fairly large. You have to understand that this is a fairly uh, uh, intensive in terms of, of human workers. Uh, so so you, you have to, to be quite, uh, or there is a big difference if you go to Asia and think about the average salary. And then in Finland and Sweden, the average salary, you still need the same amount of people roughly, except if you can uh, uh, develop the automation uh, to, a, to a new level and which we already talked about. So going back in, in time, and uh, yesterday Ilka was uh, mentioning the year 2008. I got involved in 2009 and also Metsa Group got involved in 2009. Uh, we started a series of big joint research programs in Finland, including all, let's say it like that. Uh, Co-funded or the main uh, financer was uh, Tekes, today known as Business Finland. Our own in-house research began a few years later in 2030, roughly. We can debate that with my colleagues, but this is what I've used in this slide. And we have been pushing forward since 2013. One critical thing was to invite Itochu to the project, our own project, because as I mentioned, in those days we had no understanding of the market. We needed somebody who can say if the product is good, who would pay something for this, to what direction should we develop it, and so on. And we went to this Japanese company who has been in the textile market for over 100 years. Then we went to the first pilot scale. You remember the sailing one day or something like that. So pilot scaling actually done at TITK uh, in those uh, years, 2016 and 17. And that again was partly uh, co-funded by the European Commission uh, and especially the, the BBI joint undertaking instrument. So there's a lot of support from the Finnish government through TECES or Business Finland in this work. Here you see the t-shirt made uh, in the pilot uh, trials, uh, really big milestone for us. 
But then we realized also based on the trials uh, in, in Germany that, that we don't have enough understanding of how we can recycle the solvent and so on and so on. So we, ha we started to uh, plan a demo plant. Now you remember the, the middle one in, in my scheme. And we decided in October 2018 to start building. And for that purpose, we made, made then a joint venture with Itochu. Uh, and that uh, joint venture owns the facility. Just to give you some kind of understanding, the investment, which is not a profitable investment uh, in the capex of this demo plant, is roughly 35 million euros. So it's a huge amount of money just to make sure that, that you learn who is going to fight with them, whom. This is the picture from when we started digging the ground uh, in late 2018. No snow on the ground that year in Finland. So this is in central Finland. This is when the demo plant here in the front, the white building with the black roof, was almost ready. In the background you can see the unit producing the pulp. So we have a concept where we integrate to the pulp production. And this is a very happy milestone as well. In the midst of the pandemic, when we made the first so-called bale in, uh, comprising of the product, and you can see all people s signing the, the bale. Uh, and yeah, was, as you can see from the picture, in the middle of uh, the pandemic. Now it's hopefully uh, staying a bit calmer. So with these few slides and stories, I wanted to shed some light on how we think from a company perspective on this kind of potential new innovations. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Niklas. A wonderful closing of the uh, talks. Wonderful. Now we go to the questions and answers session. And I would like to invite uh, Ilka and Herbert to come to the podium. And in the meantime, also, we have the other speakers sitting in the front row. So we can dedicate or direct some of the questions to them. So let's make this an interactive uh, uh, process. And the floor is open to you all. And um, we can just raise uh, the hands. And there will be microphones uh, going around so that we can take your questions. They will be recorded, and as indicated earlier, we're going to have the recordings available after these uh, uh, sessions. So, questions? Maybe can, yes, okay, there is one question here. Thank you very much. Patrice Mangin from uh, Trois-Rivières University. Uh, Nicholas left me on my hunger. Like from starting 2009 in the demonstration, first bail 11 years. Now the boat sailing for a full year and more, which is the commercial plant. What's your timeline about? Because you know, we, we have these innovations, which is marvelous, but it takes 15 years to get to the product. The market is changing and the society is changing. So do you have an answer, all of you, by the way, to this very important question to me? I would actually start answering your question. The whole process, um, as Nicholas said, uh, and, and we have went over uh, also yesterday, started somewhere in 2008. So that's a long time to hear. But actually, in the beginning, there was, uh, I would call it, lag time when we were trying to understand what we are actually doing. And it was only in somewhere in 2017 when we actually found those solvents what are being applied now. And it's actually after that the development has been fairly fast. So in, in a way, it also tells a little bit on, 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 on the time frame of research, because if you are doing research on, in the laboratory, you are normally working at maximum maybe a few grams, then you start piloting it like Alta did. They, they require something which is minimum of a few kilograms. And there's a upscaling to that. And then uh, upscaling even to bigger scales. And, and every time you actually 
facing new challenges. So it's it's um, when you're talking about the big process like this one, um, something which may be a side product or impurity at one person's scale in the laboratory, you won't even notice it. But actually, if you're talking about tens of tons of chemicals, one person is actually pretty much. And, and especially in that scale, it also means that we have been actually developing several things, let's say parallel or in collaboration mode, both the scaling up of the solvents, because you can buy these actually uh, from Sigma Aldrich as research chemicals. But the price for those is far beyond what you could afford actually using in a real operational plant. So there has been development or upscaling of the chemistry, but there has been also upscaling of the technique how to actually make the fibers. And, and, and especially when you, we are talking about the upscaling of making the fibers, that has been fa really fast in my opinion. So please, Herbert, continue from this. Yeah, very good question. Uh, of course, process in general, I have to say, process-related innovation has a much longer time scale as any, anything else, like IT-related one. And I think to answer a little bit this question, I think it's good to, to look back. Uh, how was that in previous innovations, which finally ended up in commercialization, like the classical NMMO-based lyocell technology? And I mentioned the first patent was filed in 1939, and the first commercial plant came on string in 1992. And you had three, four powerful companies in the back. That's not what, what we have at the moment, so we are an academic institution. And of course, we benefit from all the developments which were uh, occurring at that time, because we also used this air gap spinning technology. But I would say this is the one thing. The other thing is, of course, also the background and the money you invest. Of course, when you invest more money, uh, research money, but also uh, other money, especially when you collaborate with big uh, research institutions, uh, especially from a company, then, of course, the development um, might go much faster because the conventional operation of the processes are there established while this is needed to be built up in an academic environment first, what also has been mentioned. So when my colleagues, especially in the academia, our president and our dean asks what are the development phases, yes, we start and in two years we, we know everything what we should know within the Palo plant, Another two years, we know everything from a demonstration plant, and in five years, we have the first commercial plant. Bullshit. It's not, not going to happen. <laughs> so unfortunately, and uh, I think it's not a really a secret, the first, let's say, money you earn from a, uh, you earn from a lyocell plant was not before, let's say, mid of uh, 2005, 2010. And it's very important uh, also for you, Metze Fiverr, you have a strong... Uh, production of pulp and paper to finance your investment and in innovation. Very good. Niklas, uh, if you can respond uh, quickly. Yeah. It's just unfortunately so that, that uh, uh, engineering and building a demo plant takes about two years. It could have been a bit shorter, but we came just into the pandemic when we were almost ready, but two years. Then you need to reserve two, three years for the actual demonstration work. And then you start again, engineering and building, and the big plant is three years. So this is, uh, you cannot really change this uh, if you want to, to start uh, a completely new production process. Thank you. Um, more questions, and I would like to ask, uh, to make the questions short and the answers also short, so that we can cover as much ground <laughs> as possible. There is a question there from one of the uh, researchers participating to, in the poster sessions. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Alexandra Kozowski. I'm from Szalmarz uh, University of Technology. I have a question to Dirk, actually, to, uh, from Eurotex. Um, 
I mean, it's so nice to see that you, of course, uh, create in the, the European Union is working so hard on the creating new legalization. Um, and of course, we here we are all aware of the drawback of the fast fashion. Um, but what about the education of the society and customers? That's something also what Orlando highlighted at the end. I would like to know if the European Union has any plan to advertise what are the drawbacks and what is the advantage and how to change the thinking of the society. Um, in, in the textile strategy, the, you know, the need to focus on the consumer is recognized. The Commission is proposing uh, a campaign which we call Refashion EU, like hashtag Refashion EU. Um, we, we just announced that they will roll out the campaign. We don't know any details. So you can say at this stage, the Commission recognizes that we need to address the consumer. We, as an industry, insist on that. As I said before, we, as an industry, increasingly work with the brands to, to kind of join forces into educate is a strong word, but inform the consumer about environmental impact and, and etc. Um, so I would say the good intentions are there, um, but there is work to be done in the years to come. So to make sure that it's not just good intentions, but that we actually roll out um, this campaign with resources, with, with transparency. I mean, we have too many labels. We have too many green labels. Every brand is using its own you know, green cards, whatever it's. So we have things to do on our side in, in being more transparent. And then we need, uh, again, joint forces between the authorities, the industry and the, and, the, uh, and the brands. So let's hope it will, at least we will try to push to make sure that it actually happens. It's not just intentions. Thank you, Dirk. Mm -hmm. I think we're all consumers. I'm a consumer and sure. I have a question actually. So uh, I tell my students my favorite suit and pants are the ones that I use in my PhD graduation in IDA. And I still use those. I should have brought those uh, today because really I use them as an example. They are pretty much a lot of polyester. So my question to the speakers. Um, is uh, how far are we from getting this uh, long durability the, the, you know, in the polyester-like materials? I mean, what is the development that we need to see in this direction? Yeah, uh, good question. So I tried to, in my, my talk, I tried to emphasize uh, the criteria rela relevant to durability of textile fibers. So one is certainly the integrity of the uh, fibers. That means also the intrinsic strength properties. So that's an issue, but not of course only at under dry conditions, under wet conditions. That's very important. And uh, I think H and M uh, quoted uh, that they they refrain from using viscose fibers, probably because they have uh, some, let's say, uh, not very. Uh, um, good properties under all uh, circumstances, that's understood, of course. Uh, but I would say the new generation of lyocell type fibers, they are very cotton-like. Uh, so we have certain challenges. This is the so-called fibrillation. The fibrillation is a property um, which is more or less an intrinsic property because of the high orientation of the molecules the lateral adhesion between the crystallites is weakened, which then uh, facilitates uh, the split off of surface fibrils on wet abrasion. That's a po point. But uh, there are ways uh, to, uh, remove, uh, to, to inhibit that or to at least uh, reduce this degree of uh, fibrillation. I would say we are in a good way to, uh, to be able uh, to produce durable fibers. Of course, we are talking about cellulosic fibers or natural fibers. There are certain properties which cannot be attained using cellulose uh, or natural fibers. Uh, cellulose is a very hydrophilic polymer, <laughs> as you know, and it's uh, terribly difficult uh, to render cellulose, uh, 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 let's say, a permanent hydrophobicity. That's the problem. So for outdoor applications, we have also with our students, we try a lot of uh, options, but uh, the, uh, let's say, to combine both 
uh, green chemistry methods. Yeah, don't use any fluor, fluor hydrocarbons and silane-based carbons uh, compounds and so forth. And in addition, also to ensure biodegradability is very difficult. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Very quickly, Ilka. You were asking for short answers, but if the questions are like this, I mean, there are no short answers. <laughs> the thing is, is that uh, in every fiber or material made by man, like polyester, there are different qualities. Your uh, suit is probably high quality because it's rather old already. On the other hand, it was actually pretty clear from what Herbert said today. It's the similar situation in man-made fibers. There, so there are applications where you don't need yeah. such a high quality. And then you can use different raw materials. And, and then, on the other hand, you have the other end. So it's also balancing and, and there is actually a lot of more parameters behind this. So maybe that's... Uh, Definitely. <laughs> One question here, and if there are more questions, please raise your hand so we can locate you and, and have the microphone uh, on time. So please, any other questions, raise your hand. Please. Uh, is there a difference between different wood fibers uh, for textile? Indeed, yes, there is. Uh, um, so we basically summarize this category of fibers in so-called either man-made cellulose fibers, that's one title, the other would be regenerated cellulose fibers, uh, but that does not include, for example, cotton. So that's, that's a natural fiber. Um, and uh, these regenerated cellulose fibers, uh, so we, the typical grades are uh, depending on the processes you, you use. The viscous process, for example, uh, is of course determining to some extent the resulting properties. Even though, and that's, uh, that's quite nice, we have an expert here on viscose uh, sitting in the audience who could explain it much better, but the viscose, why is it still alive? Because it had the highest flexibility in tuning the properties compared to any other process. So it was already thought that it will die after the uh, Second World War. And then a person named Cox invented a modifier. Adding this modifier was capable of extending the uh, state where you can stretch this uh, uh, solution so that the molecules align in parallel, which give high orientation. And that way, then, these so-called high-wet modulus fibers, which are very... Uh, let's say comparable to cotton fibers, yeah, modal fibers, for example. So, and then of course the other type is the lyocell type fibers, which use a direct uh, solvent, using also a different type of spinning technique, which uh, results, let's say, intrinsically to higher tenacities and higher properties, especially under wet conditions. Ilka, you want to complement the answer? Yeah, I, I'll be very brief. We have to remember that uh, there is actually, it was actually shown in the Herbert slides that there are other emerging technologies like the carbamate process, which is being scaled up with this Finnish company, Infinity Fibers. There is mechanical treatments like what Spinova is doing. There is alcohol, alkali or alkali, different types of solutions scaled up with other companies. And I, I don't think this, there is actually competition, because what, how I see it is, is that it's just a palette of opportunities. And of course, in the end of the day, we have to see the whole palette to make correct decisions. Is, is this process viable for the textile fibers, or maybe the other one is for non-movements, and the third one for something else? Yeah. There is a question in the back. Yes. Gabriel? Yep. Hi. Gabriel Bonvillet from the University of British Columbia. I have a broad question, so it's for the laureates and uh, maybe also Mr. Eckenbach from H&M. Uh, so in the iron cell process, you chose to produce fibers in order to have a fabric as a final material, right? But in theory, you're not limited to producing fibers uh, and you could shape the serial solution into any shape, for example, um, film extrusion, right? And you could even change the surface to change the, the filling. So do you think your technology could change the way we produce clothing by directly processing it into the desired shape without having to use fibers as a transition material? Thank you. 
Thank you for the question. Actually, it's it's even more than just putting it into different shapes. Yes, that should be possible. It's not yet there, but it, there is also another uh, rather unique property of these solvents because you can also uh, use them for chemical modification. So it means that you can have different types of materials from cellulose. I mean, nowadays, the other uh, modified cellulose products are is basically more, more or less like cellulose acetate. But here, we can actually make a lot more chemistry. For example, there are already uh, good examples of producing uh, cationic cellulose, which is a water purification chemical. The beauty of that is, is that you apply it for um, precipitating the particles from wastewater. But after it has done the job, it actually decomposes back to cellulose, and that is biodegradable. So uh, actually, I see this that you might have a one line which is actually using the same dissolution technology used for making man-made fibers, but then you can have side pipes or so to produce other products. So it's not only that we are talking about um, textiles. Yes, there are other possibilities, definitely. Martin, do you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, I can add, uh, I mean, we're looking into several uh, opportunities with cellulose as well. It's uh, looking at uh, sequence, for example, uh, how do you create these small uh, shimmering effects on party dresses or kids wear from cellulose? Uh, or how do you create accessories from cellulose uh, feedstock as well? So we're looking into all what you can do with cellulose-based feedstocks as well. Uh, I think to create something else than fabric, to create textiles, then you are quite limited to creating like panels for, for garments, and that's quite a small, uh, small area. But for other applications, definitely. Thank you. Maybe you could mention that. Other questions? I, I was uh, noting that um, in the investments that I see startups, Actually, a lot of funding is coming to biology, and that was one of the h and uh, ideas, to grow cotton in the lab. So uh, do you see uh, synthetic biology and biological methods to build molecules up as a possibility in this area? Given that what I see is a huge investment, actually the, the largest in the startups are going to biology routes. Yeah. A uh, very difficult question because I'm not a biologist, uh, but uh, I have a clear idea on that. I was, uh, this is also due to the age, advanced age. There was a professor called Professor Brown, and he wanted to raise algae in the Bay of, was it Florida, uh, to produce uh, algae, but of course it never worked out. And also to use uh, carbon as a source uh, for fermenting new biopolymers is not a good solution. We have the best biopolymer with the cellulose and other biopolymers. So I'm not at all convinced. I know even big companies like Dupont uh, try to use, uh, let's say, uh, biochemically produced biopolymers like Kurdlan or 13D glucan and make very bad fibers out of it. Okay, different opinion, Ilka? Not a different opinion, but actually, um, if you are using fermentation, like we are producing beer, I mean, then we have the yeast, which is basically also containing proteins. And actually, these particular solvents, what they are talking about, they are pretty good solvents for proteins. So, yes and no. So maybe not for the cellulose, but actually uh, there might be possibilities in the side streams, yeah. which is not at all looked at, at least to my knowledge. Yeah, good point. More questions? There is one. There. Yeah, uh, thank you, Maya Tengana Hi, from yeah. University of Helsinki. Actually, following up this question, a little bit like intriguing thing is that do we need trees? Can we have it as a cell culture? It was discussed about cotton, but what about, I mean, if cellulose is so great, so do we need to have the forest for that? Or can we make it more? I know that you are not an expert on that, but kind of a <laughs> uh, Orlando's question like activated me to uh, ask this. 
Um, yes, we do. Uh, the thing is, is, is that um, yes, there is possible. There are possibilities in in making these kind of things. But actually, if you use actually cells to produce something, for example, thinking about Finland, I mean, we have a winter, so it doesn't. It's it's not. I I would claim that uh, it's not yet there. We have much better biochemists and, and biologists here in the audience, I'm sure Kalle Kamberg could, could, for example, answer that question much, much more detailed than I am capable. Yeah. I, I didn't want to distract uh, and from my own cell to biology, but I think it's a relevant, relevant question to ask. So very good point. But maybe Johanna. Yeah, just to comment so that when we are do utilizing microbes to produce something, we need car carbon and nitrogen. And where does the carbon come from? Do we first grow the tree or the plant, then we degrade it to monomers, yeah. then it contains inhibitors which are attacking the microbe, they are not letting it to work as it should. And then we are doing very tedious downstream uh, mm -hmm. processing on the liquor. I have been working with this fermentation of biomass hydrolysate, so I know it's not that easy. <laughs> so maybe we could utilize the wood or the plant. Mm. Herbert? I fully agree to that. But there is another point I would consider. Um, we have na Mother Nature makes so, so excellent uh, biopolymers. And of course, we talked about uh, wood now. But we have also annual plants, we have yeah. agricultural waste, and I think that is a second, uh, certainly the second uh, most important source for the future. There is one, uh, looking to H&M, there is one uh, intrinsic disadvantage, or actually more intrinsic disadvantage of cellulose. Uh, it does not melt, so we have to basically make a, a sidestep to produce a kind of spinning solution by uh, selecting a good uh, cellulose solvent to eventually increase the cellulose concentration. So there is already a progress. When we look at viscose, we have, let's say, in the best case, 9% cellulose in the solution. Now we talk about 13 to 17%, but it's actually not very good. So we need to go to 40, 50%. Yeah? And <clears throat> the other thing is... Um, you were talking about we urgently need something which replaces elastane. I fully agree. But what is it? So elastane is such a terrific polymer, which, uh, to my knowledge, has not ever been, let's say, uh, challenged by other biopolymers. Yeah, not at all. So this, this is something what we are really working on yeah. also. And of course, the other and the last thing is uh, tuning hydrophobicity, hydrophilicity, as I mentioned already, while maintaining the whole material environmentally friendly. Mm. Ilka. Not directly related to cellulose, but as, as a uh, continuation, what, what Johanna said is, is that actually when we go to a shop now, we can buy a milk can where there is clearly a plastic screw cap. And, and what they state in, the, in, the, in, the, in this uh, cartilage is, is that it's 100% bio-based. Yes, it is, but it is polyethylene. So what is being done is, is that they actually ferment first the sugars to ethanol, then they p produce ethene and then they polymerize it. But it's still the same polyethylene. I mean, this is greenwashing, in my opinion. And, 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 and in the old days, people were actually using the uh, wastewaters of sulfide uh, paper pulping to make ethanol for other purposes, not to make uh, ethane. And actually, ethane was used to produce ethanol for the same reasons. So. I mean, it's, it's not only that we are talking about the uh, utilization of cellulose or making cellulosic products. This is, this is all over, I mean, in all materials, and especially difficult materials are when these components, uh, like synthetic polymers, are mixed with natural fibers, like the coating of the milk can or something like that. There you have a problem with yeah. polyethylene, and I think that's much more severe. Than, than we guessed 
it is. Major problem. We're a little bit over time. Uh, maybe we can entertain a couple of more questions. Uh, please, Alexandra. Yes, I have another one. Actually. Yeah, uh, just the microphone, just a second. Thank you. It's a little bit more technical uh, from your presentation. I'm quite interested. Why did you see the upscaling of the strength in uh, in the cost, the cotton post waste? You know those uh, green and yellow mm -hmm. slides you showed. So you said that the the strength of the material increased. Is it due to the application of different solution, or is it because of the uh, spinning process? Mm -hmm. Do you know no. what? Uh, the answer was given by Frank Meister. Uh, the cotton has a very uniform molar mass distribution, and that's essential to, because when you have a certain share of short chains, as you typically have from wood pulp, this weakens, of course, the fiber. So there is a clear, almost straight line correlation between a certain fraction of short chain and the final tenacity. So we like cotton waste. Yeah. One more question. OK, maybe we can close uh, with a question I wanted to ask Herbert again. And this idea of transition between university and industry is a quite important one. And pretty much oftentimes, we scientists don't look into what is the need in industry, in society, and there is a disconnect. So how, how do you see the And world? vice versa. And vice versa. So <laughs> yeah. what is the way to, to, to bridge that, yeah. that, uh, that dilemma? Yeah, I think this is a, an excellent question. And uh, I, I like to interact with all the parties, even with institutions uh, like EU. It's important to understand what is going on. Uh, and uh, my special concern is <clears throat> because I see it, uh, young researchers very hungry for research and have their, of course, their focus typically continuing their PhD work. Uh, but this would be the moment where they go out and have a sabbatical in industry and learn the real requirements what Niklas also mentioned. So uh, this is totally different when you do something in the laboratory and then you want to gradually do it in commercial scale. Yeah. And the same also applies uh, to R&D people from companies or even production people uh, to spend a certain time in academia and to uh, more or less mutually influence yeah. each other. Very important. OK, I think. Uh, this is uh, all for today. Uh, it was really a big pleasure to host uh, this event. I would like to acknowledge the participation of our uh, steering group, uh, the selection committee, who has driven the process, have made the selection of the speakers, and of course also the laureates. And we're very proud of you, your work, and uh, congratulations on uh, our behalf. And congratulations all of you for uh, staying today, asking good questions, and thinking all together about the future of textiles uh, wearing wood. Thank you. <laughs>